What did you want to be when you grew up? I mostly wanted to be an author when I was growing up. I grew up in rural Ohio, kind of um, adjacent to Amish country and in a very, very different from the UK, a very kind of uh, dry county kind of uh, world. And I lived through the library, so I loved books. I read books. My goal at one point was to try to read every book in the library, but um, I gave up in the A section. I tackled it alphabetically and yeah, <laughs> I gave up with automotive because it was, the, yeah, it didn't in interest me somehow. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was more into the fiction and the classics, but um, yeah, I had this ambition to be a, a writer and um, yeah, that seems to have fallen by the wayside because I've not published anything <laughs> ever. <laughs> but, um, you know, I help a lot of other people. I do a lot of editing, so I'm not too mm. far away from it, maybe. And I think at some point, one of my university professors did say, oh, well, you know, to be a writer, you, you might want to do something else for a while and get experience of the world and then pick that up when you're 40 or 50. So, yeah, maybe maybe I'll aim for when I'm 50, I'll start into my, my writing phase of my career. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, sounds like a good plan. I mean, writing's a lonely occupation, isn't it? That's that's the downside of it. Uh, well, the the benefit and the downside. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm pretty much an introvert, so um, yeah, that be happy wouldn't with bother that. me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> suit me fine. But um, yeah, you do need to then arrange to kind of I don't know get other people's views on things as well. Mm. That is, I think, a real bit. I've seen that with other people is the more you share something pre-publication around a selected peer group, the better that gets and the more likely you are to have a successful and coherent end product that you're really proud of because actually mm. any one person really can't do everything and you get really blind to, I think when you work on something for a long time, you can get very blind to the to elements of it and so somebody mm. with fresh eyes will see some glaring things that you know you know but you haven't mm. put into the detail of the document or mm. you've put way too much detail in and it's very obvious to the person so it's hard to it becomes hard to judge that as you're you yeah. know becoming very expert at things so. leads 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 what is happening welcome to working hours a show about a place called leads a time called now and an activity called work my name is simon and this is all my fault you're listening to episode 27, and my guest, Cara Hazelgrave. This is another Zoom interview recorded the 22nd of October 2021. So this is a long one. It has interruptions, distractions, and diversions, but I think this is a great episode. It's funny how it works out from recording an episode to publishing it, and how the results of that affects the overall feel of the other episodes that are out now. I have a few more interviews left to publish for this year, but I'm waiting on permission for those guests, so... They will be out as soon as possible and they will be counted as episodes from this second volume of Working Hours. I might just hit 30 episodes, but we will see. I have realised that going forward, recordings have to be the most important thing now. I just need to rack up uh, as many as I can, in part so that I can give you, dear listener, some regularity and consistency. So please, if anyone can help out by either finding or recommending future guests for me, or even by being the guests themselves, and recording for the show please please do that the deal is you need to be from leeds or in leeds and you either have experience of working or at least have an opinion on work that's it you can appear anonymously on the show or you can use it to promote yourself or even your business you can do it for posterity uh, for fun or just to think about your job out loud in a new way or for any other reason tell me your reasons for coming on at working hours pod at western studios.com add a short bio and some suggestions of your availability. Anyway, so let's get into this episode. I get a bit ranty at points in this one, but do stick with it. And of course, if you disagree, get yourself on the show, unless you have nothing to do with leads, of course, in which case then just shush, I guess, or sign up to the £5 non loiner Patreon tier, and then I'll listen to what you have to say and reply. Go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod to sign up or something maybe anyway there's plenty more waffles to come from me in this episode so let's crack on cara hazelgrave is research and innovation manager for leeds institute for fluid dynamics 
based at University of Leeds, where she works with University of Leeds researchers to support the development of emergent interdisciplinary ideas. Cara helps teams craft applications in response to funding opportunities and connects businesses seeking expertise to specialist research capability. Cara originally studied anthropology and English Lit as an undergraduate at Case Western Reserve University in the US, then later studying biodiversity and conservation as an MSc at the University of Leeds. Cara then gained working experience in the environment sector, including working for regulators, Environment Agency, Scottish Environment Protection Agency, and for the regulated Yorkshire Water. To find out more about the Leeds Institute for Fluid Dynamics, go to fluids.leeds.ac.uk or follow them at Fluid Leeds. What is it that you do now? Currently, I'm a research and innovation development manager at University of Leeds, which is a long title. And <laughs> basically, I help pre award grant applications and emergent ideas coming from interdisciplinary groups. Right. So, the um, University of Leeds and many UK universities are fairly tightly siloed around their school structures and their faculty structures, but a lot of the big intractable problems in the world and grand challenges and, you know, disasters that are happening are frankly not just in one box. Mm. Um, They're not just engineering problems, but they also need humanities or they're, you know, they're not just um, medical problems. They also need financial elements. So I help kind of when people have uh, ideas about how to suggest solutions or or things they want to explore that might help benefit everybody I kind of help make sure the team is formed and then I help them through the process of getting their funding and then they go on their way and I don't mm-hmm. tend to I don't I don't get involved in that project at all so it's it's a it's a kind of odd job because it's just a series of very intense runs up to bid deadlines or millions of pounds of money to try to make sure that we've got the funding in place to you know do the good work that we do and I'm my job is made much easier because I work with the most brilliant people up at the university we do have some internationally exceptional academics up there I hadn't realized really when I joined um, quite how special the University of Leeds is um, mm. I just to be honest, was more motivated by a shorter commute because I used to work at Yorkshire Water from Leeds. And right. yeah, I was sick of driving, <laughs> you know, what should have been 20 minutes and it taking an hour or two. Um, yeah. And I was sick of driving and got rid of my car in 2018. I joined the university in 2016 though. So I've been doing this role for a while now. Mm. And I, at the moment, I'm it's fluid dynamics researchers that I'm helping, but I started doing that during the pandemic. So when I first joined the University of Leeds, I was helping Water at Leeds, who Mm -hmm. are a group who focus on water issues uh, across disciplines. And now I'm I'm helping the fluid dynamics people. And Mm. that's much bigger than just water. I mean, I thought water was a broad topic in and of itself, but fluids is fascinating. And I've learned tons during the pandemic. And it's actually the people involved have had a really big contribution to the pandemic. So you wouldn't necessarily think pandemic fluids, but actually the droplets that we're emitting with the mm-hmm. virus in, there's a lot of research happening around how infection spreads within hospital settings. And mm-hmm. again, I don't get involved in that research, but I just have to have a base kind of understanding of what's going on in order to help the different professors. So I've worked on I've helped get funding to address COVID issues um, mm. over this past year, but I've also looked at like planetary flows and, um, you know, helped people who are looking at plasmas inside planets. I'm much less, I'm still learning about that side of it, <laughs> to be fair, but um, yeah. yeah, in my role, I don't have to understand the science as much like other people are looking for the science and I'm making sure mm. that an application has a coherent overall applications are very especially for high value funding are very complex things there might be five or ten or fifteen other collaborative partners involved and you have to have 
evidential details from all of them that they're interested in the project and what they're going to commit to it and then that all has and that often is kind of changing as you're putting the project together you mm -hmm. might have a six or eight week window in which to get it all sorted out and then you have to make sure that final document doesn't have you know has all of those edited details across mm -hmm. it and, and we haven't missed that oh earlier we were planning this but then we had a slight change of idea and mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not in it anymore you know you, you've got to have somebody looking across all the bits and pieces so yeah. I'm, I'm the bits and pieces person <laughs> but it also means I don't you know I don't interact with students I mean I see them and it's lovely <laughs> that there, but I, I don't you know People quite often, oh, you work at the uni, you know, undergraduates, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, mm. yeah, they surprise me every year. They just, there's a whole bunch of them. They just turn up and I suddenly can't get across campus. <laughs> mm. But they bring so much energy and enthusiasm. I worked in um, offices, you know, um, and mostly, you know, like Yorkshire Water Environment Agency, Premier mm. Burnell, and offices you go into and, oh, it's Monday. You can feel it's Monday university you go in and particularly this time of year you know there's enthusiasm there's a whole mm. world in front of these people and there's just a different mood and and that's mm. a very nice element of working at a university yeah uh, yeah i hadn't i hadn't um i always kind of when i was working in business i was often got feedback i'm a bit too academic for them sometimes and a bit too into the <laughs> detail or the why or the questions and now of course that I'm working at the university I'm a little too business orientated sometimes for people I'm like what, what what's the end application or you know how are you going to develop this or who's going to you know what's the mm. path to a market but we work on such sort of fundamental science usually mm. that actually path to market and development of products is further down the chain and some other part of University of Leeds's role yeah take that side of things particularly so yeah I'm I'm in a very fundamental uh concepts space and it can be a little overwhelming sometimes to be fair and a little bit depressing as well as exciting because you know you do hear from people you know are internationally exceptional and you know life is looking kind of bleak for the globe and mm. you're sometimes in an all-day meeting hearing about detailed bleakness yeah <laughs> and um yeah that's i find that a bit challenging sometimes but. what sort of part of the school are you in then are you in a particular like you know school of engineering or something like that are you across them or what what sort of faculty do you work in so i work in research and innovation services um, right yeah yeah, yeah sorry. and and so i have there's a whole there's a small team of people in research mm -hmm. and innovation services who do have the same job job title as me, but we all work to support different overarching interdisciplinary groups. So yeah. mine are the fluids people. Um, there's also energy, there's med tech, there's cancer, there's culture, there's food, you know, so there's there's different mm. people and we're University of Leeds has invested, so they built, you might have seen Nexus, the big, yeah. beautiful building that, that, I mean, God, that building looks more like it's architectural drawings than any other finished building I've ever seen. It's amazing. Yeah. So we're kind of like the interface between the external world sometimes and, and all these different faculties, because it's actually, mm -hmm. it can be administratively difficult to work across faculty or across mm -hmm. schools and sometimes culturally difficult because you'll find some academics really like their corner or their subject and that's fine they, they just want to do their their fundamental whatever they like to do mm -hmm. and other academics are much more skipping across multiple ones or or connecting different things or curious about other subjects and you know so I have people that are in mechanical engineering who collaborate with people in biology and part of my role is to help make that happen they often when they first set up water at Leeds I was at Yorkshire Water and kind of looking in at the university and as mm -hmm. the Yorkshire Water research and research team person I was trying to stimulate academia to not just give us catchment science or flooding kind of research, but to 
look more broadly at what the sector's needs were and to do that kind of joined up stuff. And Water Leeds has done a brilliant job at it. They've been going for more than 10 years now. And that's a very good template for um, looking at interdisciplinarity across uh, a subject. So you find when you go into into some of the spaces in the university, and I think it's probably true at all universities, not the University of Leeds is particularly big, particularly broad, and um, there's a high turnover typically of kind of some of the staff within the university and some, mm. you know, there's undergraduates come and go and PhDs come and go and mm. there's a lot of moving parts. And part of what I do is I, I run events and um, or support events uh, where we bring people from different spaces together who have a common subject interest like they might all be in, you know have fluids as an issue or mm. something that's a part of their research and I have some that are like fluids experts and some that say a chemist might be having a fluids problem but mm. they don't they don't have the methodologies and the skills and the training that is mm there to solve that problem. They're more interested in the chemistry that's happening. And if yeah. you can bring those people into the same space, you suddenly find, not all the time, but you get aha moments between them where they're, yeah. you know, they all, we, we get them to do flash talks quite a lot where they do three or five minutes and a lot of different people from a lot of different, from different schools mm. or taking different approaches will give sort of three to five minutes and then kind of let them, it, before COVID, we would have then let them have tea and you know and then they go and find you know the person that they yeah. stimulated a question in their mind and go and you know chat and sometimes yeah. that goes somewhere and sometimes it takes a year or two and I mean mm -hmm. you know it it's sowing the seeds of you know connection and if you don't if you haven't met somebody you're not likely to pick up the phone and ask them something and think yeah. that they're going to help you. But once you've kind of met them and you think, oh, they've got an interest in that over there and mm. they might be able to, or connect me to somebody else, you know, it just helps solve little problems and helps people build a bigger idea than, you know, like mm. sometimes it's just a tiny idea and they're like, oh, look, I've got this tiny idea, mm. but their, their experience and their background just make, you know, it would be a tiny project. It would be fine, but it would be mm. small. But then once you've, shared that with a few other people and the enthusiasm builds and you get this momentum going you know you can you can make a really I mean that's how the big different that's how the world's going to be saved is by all these brilliant people kind of talking to each other <laughs> these things through yeah. you know um and, and working together instead of I think I mean I joined in 2016 and uh, I did go to the University of Leeds as a master's student and I found coming from the states things felt very, very siloed at the university back then. Mm. And that's not uncommon from what I've heard. But I came from a very interdisciplinary undergraduate mm. uh, community. So I went to uni in 1991 and we had internet in all the, like internet wired into all the dorms at that mm. point in time. And I just thought internet was something you got when you went to uni <laughs> <laughs> um, for about a year and then yeah, it, it took a while for the penny to drop, but this was the cusp of something yeah. very new and very different. Um, yeah. And yeah, I don't know. It's a. Well, I don't think it's even finished doing what it's going to do yet. <laughs> we're, no, we're, we're still very much at the beginning of it. It's kind of like, it's not even a proper mature technology yet, is it? No, and it's, it's kind of terrifying, but it's kind of, you know, amazing as well. I mean, mm. uh, just over the pandemic, it's been very interesting to see how much it's unlocked around accessibility to mm. things that may not have been accessible to people who have health conditions or who have caring commitments and can't mm. go to a conference or who are living in India or the States or you know anywhere in the world and they wanna come and join in um, they've mm. been able to do that because we've been running so many events online so mm. we had a, a, a launch of um, you the UK fluids network launched a report um, called our fluid nation talking about the the value of fluid dynamics to you know the UK as a whole and this ambition mm. with a lot of the key principles and or uh, concepts of fluid dynamics have British people's names attached to them you know this has been mm. an area where we've been 
leading the world for a long time, mm. but actually in order to maintain that leadership role, you have to continue to invest. You can't think, oh, I've done that and take yeah. um you you have to try to bring on all the the new stuff as well and and, and fold that in to like machine mm. learning and AI and uh, overwhelming amounts of computational ability. There's so much mm. potential. You, you could have more data than a human can ever get through to even see whether there's useful stuff in it. So then you have to start writing code that picks the useful bits out of data you've mm. not had a human go through. It's There's some very challenging kind of mind blowing questions that, that crop up on a day-to-day -day basis <laughs> around um, what we do. Um, so that must be exciting. It is, it is. It, like I say, it's it's that it's it's almost equal parts exciting and overwhelming in a too much way sometimes. But um, you know, it's it all feels very useful, really, um, in the grand scheme. So yeah, kind yeah, of. And awesome. and you're looking right. at kind of cutting edge information and and cutting edge methods of kind of working with that. Um, so that's, I mean, that in itself is exciting, you know. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about a, a little bit about how you you kind of got into it. So you came through Yorkshire Water and so on. I mean, you've done, you've done a couple of qualifications, a few qualifications. <laughs> um, so like what makes you the, I mean, you can choose a different word, but I'm going to use expert on like interdisciplinary, inter, interdisciplinary matters. What, what experience and... The other question I would have is how do they, or how do you, how do you pick across the disciplines? Is it like you look at a particular subject and you go, okay, well, that subject needs these disciplines or are the disciplines already there and you're looking for subjects for them to work on? How does it work? Right, that's, that's So two questions, how did you yeah. get into it? And what, what do you, what yeah. is the, the meat of picking things? Okay, so I, how far back to go <laughs> so I did an anthropology degree I went to South Korea for a year and taught English just because I could get paid to do that and I couldn't afford to travel um otherwise so I I got some money first flight really went over to South Korea for a year and the air air quality in Seoul was mm. so disturbing <laughs> uh, so bad it was such poor quality air that there really weren't many birds apart from pigeons and um in the city and uh and people said this was because of the air quality i that's anecdotal i don't really know whether that's the case pigeons aren't indigenous to south korea was also something else i was told and that they'd been released at the olympics as instead of doves and then they just made a good home for themselves um, and stayed and bred like crazy. Um, and down in the subway system, they would play bird song. And by the end of one year in South Korea, I was like, I, I, my interest in, in environmental topics that I had before mm. has been heightened in a new way. And so I, I then moved to the UK and um, did biodiversity and conservation uh, at a master's level. And, it's very difficult to get employed in mm. conservation. Uh, mm. A lot of the people that I know that have skills in that area um, volunteer for a year or more before, mm. you know, with an organization before they get a conservation role. Mm. And I didn't have that luxury. So I went into um, the environment agency instead and mm. uh, did temp jobs for them and things. Um, anyway, I. I, I don't feel like I used my anthropology degree for quite a long mm. time, although I was interested in it. It's, it's kind of hard to say, I'm an anthropologist, employ me, uh, particularly in the 90s for some reason. Um, it, it just wasn't really recognized as a skill. Culture really wasn't talked about in the same way it is these mm -hmm. days. And yeah, I kind of kept my anthropologist perspective through all of these steps. So, you mm -hmm. know, when I was at the environment agency and then when I was at Yorkshire Water and then from Yorkshire Water I was very motivated to have a, a shorter commute I was having health issues and the commute was definitely contributing to that and um, so I moved to Premier Farnell for a year or year and a half which was very interesting electric electronics distribution how could mm. I even work with them um, but I'd uh, I'd gotten into data governance 
somehow <laughs> at Yorkshire Water. I went from research and innovation, then they closed the team down. So I got put into data governance. It's uh, kind of like you you know numbers, so you do this. Was it that kind of it, it was only I don't really know numbers. Right. I just know <laughs> I can spot when they're wrong or what's yeah. you know what I mean? So I was working with a team where yeah, we were we we were working all virtually pretty much from in in this was well pre-pandemic like 2015 we you know down there on the canal it's amazing you've got people like multiple people dialed into the same meeting pre pre-pandemic because you know half the team is in chicago half the team's in bangalore so like for some people it's very early and for some people it's very late and here in the uk you're having your afternoon tea feeling very <laughs> chunky yourself um <laughs> but uh but yeah and then i heard that well, I, I noticed that they were recruiting at the university and I, I do have a fondness for academia and academics and, and all of the work that goes on. And I'd seen at Yorkshire Water that there was, it didn't seem like the stuff was getting to the people, you know what I mean? Like I knew there was research that had happened in areas, but it wasn't being implemented in industry. Mm. And I mean, actually the time at Yorkshire Water, you in an in a innovation team you kind of like you see that you know there might be 100 research projects mm. and if you take them forward out of that 100 you might end up with oh if you're doing well you might end up with 30 or 40 projects that you're developing further that might suit the business and then out of those you might find that there's 10 that you're you consider for implementing into a big business and then maybe one or two will actually get implemented Mm. And maybe like 0.4 of that successfully, you know, so like mm. if you go back two years later and you go, I'm going to take that technology that you didn't want away from you. And they they go, no, I like it now. I didn't like it when you first brought it. But and I got to go around the whole organization as part of the innovation team and go, hi, marketing. How are you? How can we help you innovate? And actually, mm. people who are doing a day to day job, they mostly just want you to go away. Um, <laughs> frankly, <laughs> you're like, what do you mean innovate? And I'm like, there must be something, you know, like I, I, whenever I've done a job, I've, I've dreamed about things that could make my job easier, but actually that's, that's not all encompassing. Not everybody seems to do that. So that surprised oh, I think me. What, what people hear, I think most of the time, cause I've done like organizational change stuff. And, and I think what people hear is, you know, you come along and you say, I'm going to make your work life easier and faster and better. And it's like, everybody's heard that a million times. It's like, no, you're going to change what I do and mess things about. And you're going to make everything harder for me and more complicated <laughs> and make me do yeah. more work. <laughs> because there's a learning curve to everything, isn't there? Yeah. So like the learning curve, like most people are so busy that they don't have, and, and organizations don't give them the time to have mm. that learning curve. Um, and and it can take a year or two to get something going mm. and everybody to be doing the new thing and it to be better and in between when you've taken away the thing they had and when they've got the new thing better you know mm. that time for them is not going to be pleasant I've tried to do this with change teams even and roll out new change to them and they're just as reluctant as everybody else <laughs> um, so that really interests me um, yeah and and fascinates me and i thought when i saw the the post going at the university well i've not got an academic background but i had a friend who'd who was working over there who'd been at yorkshire water quite a few former yorkshire water staff have gone over to university of leeds mm. um so we're like a little subgroup within <laughs> and, um you know it, it's it's good for the university to have people who have experience of, of implementing things in a messier environment, you know, because mm. we can, you know, I, I can put my hand up early on in a project and say, I know that you're thinking about creating a, so like one of the areas I work in is sewage. So you're going to create a fake poop in order to test your yeah. device out. But I'm really concerned that your fake poop is not going to be a good yeah. test that actually yeah. maybe we were right near Eschholt maybe we could get something going and get some of Eschholt's sludge for you to yeah. use even though you probably have different health implications when you're doing your research yeah. in your lab and that might be a little bit more difficult actually your end product might be a little bit better because yeah you need to see the, the variability over time yeah. and 
yeah so it 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 that motivated me um to to apply at the uni and to to go across um and also things at premier farnell were changing so it had been a, a the the team i was in had been growing and expanding and on on the up when i joined at premier farnell and then they were being sold and things were becoming uncertain and i just thought well, yeah, I'll give the university a go. We'll see how I get on. But actually, I really enjoy working um, at the uni. And University of Leeds is investing in trying to make these interdisciplinary things work a lot mm. better. And there's, you know, um, I mean, my role is a testament to that. Nexus as a building is, is a testament mm. to that commitment that they have. And all the funding for academia across the entire UK is kind of driving more towards collaborating more effectively with with industry but they speak really different languages do the academics and the mm. industry people so you find at events you'll have like uh, you know eight academics and two industry people or you'll have eight industry people and two academics you kind of seem to get one or the other you very rarely can get like kind of paired equal numbers in an event together and that's very interesting to me like I ran big I ran like a TEDx or I helped deliver a TEDx when I was at Yorkshire Water and mm. um and then we did a few things that were TEDx style events and it was amazing to you know people would be going into the event going like oh you know I don't I mean I, I'm here because of that little bit on the the agenda and I kind of got you know yeah interested but I don't know about the rest of this stuff it's probably not for me I don't really know why I'm here today but you know it's there's a lunch and whatever and I'll probably see some people that I might you know find mm. useful and by the end of it they'd come out enthused and with their minds like kind of blown I mean we once we had a brilliant pairing of a magician doing like a magic act and mm. then just afterwards a health and safety talk about missing things when mm. you're working and the the ease with which you can like the magician you know you're concentrating on one element and you're missing yeah. the things that are happening in the background you know yeah. like um it was very effective and very it, it, it i listened to emma bierman's um interview earlier yeah. and uh, i've never met emma but um i've seen what she does on twitter and i have a lot mm. of respect for that but i kind of think sometimes like what i'm trying to achieve is a lot like that but just with people who don't tend to think of themselves as playing because they're very serious scientists. Yeah. Um, but you you find the best teams do have a kind of, or the, the best projects and the, the most successful ones. It's hard work, but it's yeah. also very playful in the kind of how they've approached it. They've had to kind of open their mind to what, mm. what might be in order to make progress. Um, I love the way you've put that. I don't, it, it gives me a picture in my mind of like, you know, an, an executive and an academic in a shipping container, you know, like they're blending it with Emma's, <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> in like jumpsuits or something. And there's like, you know, a ball pit around them. It's like, I'm trying to create the space for these, you know, the, the social giants to kind of interact and, and, and play and come up with ideas and think of new ways. And yeah, yeah. but that's the image that it puts in my head. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think there should be more mixed generational things, to be honest. I've, I've mm. read some interesting research that I can't, I don't know if I could get a reference for at the moment, but um, around like, if you have toys in executives office, like the, where they meet up, mm. um, if you have kids things in that space, the decision-making is better. Like mm. it's more benevolent, it's more uh, responsible. Um, mm. It's just a little nudge, but it it's there's something about thinking about all the generations that's very important mm. and that gets missed out of a lot of life here. <laughs> yeah, mean. and I think a lot of it is is, uh, is is sort of having something kind of presence of mind as well. I mean, you, you know, going back to TEDxy things, I've read was it Drive or one of those, but they they're talking about if you do, you know, if you get a bunch of executives to or, or whoever you get a bunch of like sort of higher class people um and they're going to do a thing i think it was a cheating test i may be mixing up a bunch of things but it was like 
so go and do this test where you essentially cheat and like how can we motivate people to cheat more and how can we motivate them to cheat less and they were basically like if you did something like you read the 10 commandments before you went into the meeting or you went to do the sort of cheating you were less likely to cheat because that was more present in your mind sort of thing yeah, yeah. and i I read another thing where they were talking about weapons of just like if there is a weapon in a space, the tone automatically becomes more aggressive. It it doesn't need to be held by someone. It could just be on a wall. But it yeah, uh, yeah. So all these random things that can have big impacts and big influence. Gender balance is also really really helpful with all kinds of teams. I've seen. Mm. Um, I mean, I I think it's it's been communicated before but I mean I personally I've been in all female teams I've been in all male teams and um well apart from me um and uh and I definitely think that getting a gender balance is quite important and getting diversity in that initial team is really important I mean that is one of the things when I'm helping a, a professor and academic think about what they're going to be doing Mm. and he, he or she has some options you know we need and th that's maybe the second question that you asked me you know how do you pick across these mm. these different groups to bring them together what you tend to have is either a funder driven or a an academic driven project or mm. or motivation and so if the funder puts something out there and says oh we're we're, we're happy to fund xyz what you do is you take that to the academics and you say, does anybody want to do X, Y, Z? And mm. if then somebody puts their hand up, then you you get them together, you look at what's needed and you might need some extra skills. And that's the point at which you sometimes have to go to a different discipline. Mm. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, you have to get multiple disciplines. They won't speak the same language. They sometimes mm. use the same terms and they mm. use them to mean different things. Yeah. Um, and someone like me who is an expert in any of it, being in the room, I help pick that out. So, you know, somebody uses an acronym. I'm, I'm like, could you just let us know what that is? Cause not everybody here yeah. is part of your niche. Yeah. And, and it, I mean, I don't tend to put it like that when I ask the question, I just ask the question, oh, you know, what's that? But it's, yeah. it, it, and it role models asking when you don't know and yeah. interdisciplinary space is very fraught and strange in that with some research and some projects everybody's on the same page and they know the same things and they have the same background effectively and they are yeah. there's a top expert and then there are other people within it that are contributing to what that person's doing yeah. with interdisciplinary you've really got to kind of trust and maybe it's beneficial to have known, you know, to have met and, and worked with on a small thing, the people that you're working with, because you're expert in your bit and then other people who are, you know, you're not gonna know whether they're doing it right. You've got to trust them to be doing it right. They bring mm. all their bits to the table. And I've had like projects where you have engineers and social sciences working together and you you have a meeting and kind of, one group or the other hasn't turned up for that meeting and you'll get mm. engineers all frothy about the social science element and they'll mm. they'll spend like half a meeting kind of blah 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 about the social sciences and I'll, I'll have to cut in and say look they're not sat over trying to design the sewage works right you know they, the social sciences are not gonna come and try to do your job so why are you trying to do theirs yeah yeah Back off and ask uh, them what you need to ask them yeah and then respect what they tell you and, and let's in fact let's get you all together in a room and and sometimes I, because i'm in a position where sometimes i've brought people together who don't know each other at all yeah um, you know it's it really it really annoys me that though like i did a, i did a film and media degree and you know, one of the things they teach you in a media degree is like, you know, whenever you're doing media research, you always ask, you know, you never ask the person how the media affects them because everybody thinks that the media doesn't affect them, it affects other people. And it's this sort of, and because it's in the area, like everyone knows media or with a lot of social science, it's like, they think it's a matter of opinion or of politics. And to a degree it is, there are biases and this, that and the other, but it's also like, they are doing work and looking at data and like and are doing it rigorously and are coming back to it and you know it does move forward it's messy because it's people and people are messy 
you know but that doesn't mean that they're not experts in it and that you should just discount what they say because you don't like it and you have an opinion of how people should be yeah Yeah. the rant over sorry (laughs) no no it's it's a fair it's a fair rant and they're you know I mean it goes across all ways you know like yeah um everybody well like people not respecting business of like well, this is how you make money. It's like, well, I'm not interested in that. It's like, well, yeah, but you need to be because you need to fund your thing. So, yeah, you, I mean, the academics have the luxury of not being not all equally interested. And actually, open access is quite a, you know, especially given what I do is not very close to the product end of things. Mm. You know, actually, open access is quite a a good and beneficial thing. You get a lot of sort of problems cropping, or not a lot, but like what I've seen recently is, you know, you, you starting to have an ability to have like open data hosted about a certain thing and it can be very Mm. beneficial. So there, there's a project that was happening. A friend of mine was involved with that looked at for it's called forest plots, I think. And it's, you know, um, people who are going out and taking measurements of trees in the rainforest, which is expensive Mm. and, you know, intensive and, uh, requires people to physically get to the place and then get to the tree and then mm. do whatever they do with the tree yeah. um, that the way that or the, the kind of measurements you would take about a tree weren't all being taken across that community in the same way but they mm. made a database so that if you got your data or if you got certain data collected in a certain way you could all the whole world can load it into this database which means that everybody's research is suddenly more valuable because it can be Mm. contributing to this ongoing thing and actually you could then have that tree that you looked at 10 years ago and you could potentially go back to it and do more measurements you know because they're trying to calculate how much carbon the the trees take out of Mm. and 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 also like the health of the forests and and all sorts of Mm. things um just making that standardization so innovation and standardization seem kind of like uh they might fight if they were in a room together with yeah. some people but actually in order to get the innovation sometimes you have to have a little bit of standardization and people are like oh no that's boring it's boring it's like no we'll all do it the same way and then we can all share <laughs> and we could all actually it, it i have that rhetoric about a lot of things you know like actually if people who do similar jobs did them the same way kind of you could mm. have more role changing and more you know diverse experience not again that doesn't motivate lots of people but um it, it, some people do see the the benefits of it and i've seen it be successful time and time again you know where you 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 agree a standard across a, a, a group of people and then you can mm. suddenly do cooler stuff because you know that standard thing is all being done in the same way and suddenly instead of each person having their own little picture you've yeah. got a big picture that's yeah coherent that you can trust the coherence of (laughs) Um, well you need you need to as well uh, you know because you need like so I suppose if anyone's thinking well what what could that be so something like dvds or you know third generation mobile all of these things they have to be the, the standards have to be agreed so that you can have the interoperability so that it can connect to things or something like screws standard yeah. screw sizes and it's like well Yeah, well, that makes sense because everyone's going to make all different screws of different shapes and thicknesses and styles. And and it's like, well, which screw do I use? So you need a level of standardization, so which you can build other things on. I suppose the other thing with that as well, you know, with kind of tasks that teams do, standardization, would you say, is a step towards automization? Yeah, it can. It can. I mean, it's. It doesn't necessarily lead to that, but it, yeah. it's a certainly you know, makes you it can't easier do that it. with you can't do the standard yeah. the automation without having that yeah. standard. And of course, working out in industry, I see how you know I've helped roll out ISOs and you know like make sure processes are meeting standards. Mm. So I've seen the value in in that side of it, and so yeah, I'm an, I'm a big advocate for for like yeah, kind of agreeing a way forward you know as widely as possible across the community I mean Mm. I don't know I don't I don't really work on standards very much these days but um but I'm always kind of like yeah and what you know is with with anything you're doing 
you also might bump into, you know, there are current standards in play that you're disrupting. Mm. And so, yeah, just the overall awareness is a bit lost, <laughs> actually, <laughs> in my, my thread there. But <laughs> I don't know if you know this US uh, labor organizer called Jane McAlevey. No. Uh, Oh, she's great. Um, so she's got this, so she proposes it as like, um, what three things would you change in your, you know, if you could change anything, what are the three things that you would change right now? Right. Well, I've got my ballot. So you've got a blank check here. You can like anything. So this yeah. is like ideal. It's ideal, but I have my UCU uh, strike ballot paper next to me. Right. <laughs> And I haven't sent it back in yet, but um, yeah, I think there's a, a need for stuff that seems very far away from my working job to just mm. be sorted out more effectively, you know, short term mm. contracts and just the way academia works overall mm. in the UK. Um, is a little bit broken. I know brilliant people who have not stayed in academia because you know, they can't buy a house on one short term contract after another, you know, you can't yeah. get a mortgage, you can't yeah. have any stability, which affects some people's idea of whether they want to have a family or, you know, like all sorts yeah. of things. And, yeah. and they sometimes, if you're very specialist, you know, there might be four or five places in the world where you're interested in working because that's where your lab is or where your, you know, intellectual colleagues are. Mm. And so, you know, there's a an amazing diversity up at the university as far as international people and mm. you know, you, sometimes you go up and you're like I, I don't think I've heard a, a Leeds accent all day yeah. <laughs> um, you know it, it's it's a different world up there but mm. um, I do think and I do think that it's beginning to change because it has to change anyway but mm. the, the ED and I the the equality diversity inclusion agenda is just super super critical and needs to I mean I would go with like whatever they're saying about the climate like you need like 11 we've got 11 years to save the planet I think it's probably down to 10 or 8 or something mm. now it was a few years ago they were they were saying that but I think EDI and I have has to transform within possibly a shorter time frame than that in order to enable that us to save it you know frankly we need, yeah, I get we need everybody's good yeah. minds and I'm really frankly sick of people who and I don't experience this very often currently but I have in various times uh at the uni and at other places but sick of people who play office politics for personal gain you know frankly we're we it's just too important you know get over yourself you don't like somebody well we need them we need to be a team be mm. professional it wouldn't be it wouldn't be tolerated some of the cattiness um in some sectors uh mm. but you know there's definitely a lot of egos involved mm. and i guess if you're working with internationally excellent people you you do kind of you know there are going to be a lot of egos and some of them are you know they're 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 all important for whatever reasons but um mm. i find some of the best people don't have that you know they manage to get a team together yeah. they work really hard to short deadlines and deliver excellent quality and it's fun and we all feel valued and we might work a little bit out of hours or even for a very short amount of time a lot out of hours just to get it mm -hmm. through but then after that we're that's recognized and you're able to do some other tasks that aren't quite as intense for a little bit I mean actually some of those really excellent people go from big project to big project, you know, that it's unrelenting. Mm. And actually uh, the professor that I work with that's on stage, I mean, she's she's a superhero to me. She just, it's amazing to see how she's gone through this past year and and managed to, you know, advise the government and and look after her research and and still have a smile on her face most of the time I see her and, mm. uh, and value the people around her and not be, you know, super egotistical about things you know it can happen and it's you know yeah. it's great um when you see it and and then other people are like and you think it doesn't have to be like that and yeah. i've seen the proof because i can see other people managing things better mm. and and actually the things that are required for ed and i are very similar to emma's playful things 
and are very similar to what I need to make my interdisciplinarity work because ED and I people need to feel welcome. They need to know, they need to have found out that something's happening and mm. people don't even see that they, they might advertise for a PhD or a postdoc in certain spaces, mm. but maybe they're only getting a very narrow group of people because only a very narrow group of people know to look in those places for mm. the opportunity. And actually maybe we need to think about more broadly, how do we communicate about things at the very beginning and mm. how do we so one of my mantras with the academics I work with is like, well, how diverse is your network right now? And mm. do you maybe need to, when you go to a conference, you know, just try to get to know some more people that aren't exactly like you mm. and in, in the nicest possible way, you might find that very beneficial. And then when you mm. go to put your project team together, you know, mm. if you need somebody with this particular skill, you might have three or four options and you can then look back at the team and say, well, what's the team lacking that isn't just that skill that these four mm. people have? And, you know, how could I get that team to be more gender balanced? How can I get the maximum amount of diversity and the right skills all together? Mm. And then you've got some kind of magic usually. And, mm. and you, you know, you get the funding and they go off and they do their things, you know, they, they just do all sorts of amazing stuff. Mm. Um, I mean, I go around to the different schools sometimes or, or different faculties and, and explain that I'm here and I can help, mm. but you don't really have, I don't know if you know Ernest, Ernesto Ciroli, I don't know, Ciroli Institute. He, he wrote a book called um, Ripples in the Zambezi and mm. it was about how um, he went as a young person, Italian researcher to Africa and um, was trying to be helpful and got some project growing tomatoes and you know it's like look these are amazing tomatoes look you, you all could grow tomatoes as an economic solution and blah 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 and then just as the tomatoes ripened the hippos came and ate it all <laughs> and, um, and the local people were like and they were like why didn't you tell us and they're like you didn't ask <laughs> and, and but his thing is kind of like shut up and listen like nobody's yeah. going to share their brilliant genius idea in a town hall environment right yeah. <laughs> you need to make yourself available and then the people that have the ideas they'll come to you and he's yeah. had a very successful way of kind of helping people do what they want to do as small businesses actually sometimes they grow into big businesses sometimes it doesn't work and I, I'm always really fascinated about the like SME sort of world and, and that mm. end of things, even though I don't work in that these days, I've, I've been involved in that in the past mm. um, and seen the, the whole gamut from it fails to, you know, it's massively successful. And they're both kind of scary ends of a spectrum, actually, you know, because yeah. I've seen people <laughs> who like, they start something and it takes off and then they're, you know, they're. <laughs> Stuck with shocked it. <laughs> and understaffed yeah. and you know they have a hard time overwhelmed with that. Yeah. that can kill a business as easily as no business you know so yeah. it's it, it it's a it's hard you know <laughs> it's yeah. difficult work um it's sort of not so much just what is to be done but also what can be done you know what can we actually do i i, I spoke to someone recently who is um an entrepreneur who set himself up as a, a business sounding board and he he was saying you know, he, he made this point very clear with like people who are starting businesses and then they're like, who's your customer? And like most of the time people will be like, oh, well, everyone is like, well, it's not because first of all, not everyone's going to come to you. And secondly, if everyone did, you wouldn't be able to service them anyway. So you, your customers are not everyone. So at best, yeah. I suppose, taking that further, your customers are the exact amount of people that you can serve <laughs> and no more until you get more staff. Yeah, and, and, and you have to think about that so that I mean ideally so you don't get stuck because you can't always just get drop new staff in you you have to plan for, for that growth yeah and the type of staff that you want and what you want them to do and yeah and it yeah and it can sometimes take people you know a few years to become competent and you know fully delivering in their role I think I mean that was something you touched on earlier about like the do roles change over time or mm. does the, do, do we do the same job that like when you start something, you know, mm. actually five, six years later, are you still doing the same thing or, yeah. you know, are you not? And that, that 
question fascinates me and I'm not sure I can address it really with what I'm doing right now, but it, I'm going to have to think about that one for a while. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a funny, funny one. I mean, I think people dream of being wrecked by success versus, you know, the, yeah. the what are those things yeah, exactly. that... I'm just on a record. Oh. Just record. Sorry. <laughs> if you need a minute, that's fine. No, no, no. Um, yeah, sorry, what were you saying then? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> one thing one thing I would like to throw in I think is um I mean it's in it's it's not so much in regard to probably normal most people's work but um because if you think about like the the Yorkshire water do uh, you want to innovate they're just like no we want to just be left to do our thing please um mm -hmm. I mean and that wasn't all of Yorkshire water by any stretch it was it was more operational teams mm -hmm. uh, and what have you uh but like in the university, you go around and ask. So I, I interviewed um, a set of uh, a, a highly selected set of young early career researcher type academics when I a couple of years ago, um, partly out of my own curiosity and because I managed to squeeze the time and get a good reason to do it. And I'm mm. an anthropology person by background. So I was like, I want to ask these people this set of questions. We've done some. Mm. We've done a crucible program, which is designed to help people think about interdisciplinarity differently and give them more skills to do it successfully. And um, I, I was asking them, you know, like how create, you know, give a, give you a line on a piece of paper and one end is one, I'm not creative at all. And the other end is 10, I'm highly creative, got new ideas all the time. And the academics are all, almost all of them like up on the 910 area, whereas I think a lot of people don't feel like they have idea. The academics problems are really different from other people's problems in that they're so overwhelmed by the multitude of ideas, they struggle to prioritize them. Whereas like some people are like, I don't really have new ideas. And, and like, that's just, to me, that's a little bit of an odd mindset because I'm, although I'm not an academic, I, I do constantly kind of like have ideas about things that could happen or you know what have you mm. um so i sympathize with the academics but um i kind of like i i and again going back to emma um i was doing reading around informal learning i i first couple of years that um my child was uh at school age i did mm. homeschooling and so i was looking into informal education and you know how i might approach that and i found this great little clip about it buried in a book about all about informal learning in children about informal mm. learning with researchers and mm. looking at Watson and Crick and DNA mm. and um, apparently Watson had published uh, an article after the DNA discovery and you know all their mm. success that was much more about the couple of years where they they hadn't you know kind of before the discovery Mm. And um, of course, the success itself, the paper that kind of shares the results is very dry, it's understated, it's very, you know, formal and, and what wow. have you. The, this other bit of information that came out from him explored more like he'd gone back over his diaries and all sorts of things, you know, the false steps and the, um, the element of play with the subject that they had to mm. kind of get going between different people and how like, an incorrect result there that they didn't realize was incorrect kind of led them mm. down a, the wrong corner for quite a while and how they got mm. back to it. And this idea that like, actually to do something really cutting edge, it's almost like driving in fog. You know, when mm. you're driving in fog and you're behind somebody, you're like, oh, go on, hurry up, speed up. I'm following your lights, it's fine. And then if you were to overtake them, you'd suddenly be driving into fog with no lights in front of you. You'd slow down mm. quite a bit, right? You, <laughs> your way forward is not always clear and yeah. I think even when you do PhD level usually to do a PhD your way is clear you've decided you might not be successful with it but you've you when you get accepted into PhD I think you pretty much like being given something that the researchers are pretty sure is going to work yeah and then you make it work and then that's you know what you do um but when you're doing the cutting edge stuff it there's more risk involved and mm. it's this appetite for risk and this idea of like actually 
And you can feel that when you get to that point where the direction is very unknown. And even the people who are experts in the field are a little bit like, oh, we're not sure how that bit of this four or five year pro program is going to go. So mm. we're going to make, we're, we'll make these kind of arrangements and build a bit of flexibility into it and, and all sorts. There's ways of handling those, those sorts of mm. moments. But I love the idea of, of the cutting edge stuff being, you know, mm. yeah, like driving in fog um, and, and, and very much helped by playing around with the idea and having silly fun with it there's there's yeah. a lot of people oh i'm not going to remember her name now um there's a i saw a woman talk at welsh waters innovation session it would have been just before the pandemic and she showed the monty python skit where they're slapping people in the face with fishes and she said that's <laughs> what i do as a job I'm I'm <laughs> the innovation person for this big engineering company and I go around and I basically I, I take people and I put them in rooms and I make them brainstorm in ways that they you know they've they've not tried before and it's mm. very silly and for example they had a problem developing people with problem that involved snow build up on the lines of electricity mm. and how do you knock the snow off in like a rural area and you know how do you how do you solve this problem and it got crazy they were like let's get bears to go and shake it well how would you get the bears there well you put honey honey on the the thing and the <laughs> bears would come and they'd shake the pole and then and then they're like well how would you get the honey in and then they were like oh well you'd have to fly oh actually maybe the helicopter so they, they the solution was if a helicopter goes across the top mm. a certain distance it actually removes the snow because of mm. the the wind that mm. it creates, but like they got to that through the bear. They didn't get to that. You know what I mean? Like collectively <laughs> yeah. that answer was in the room, yeah, yeah. but they needed to get very silly in order to get to the solution. Mm. And yeah, 90% of what you say in those environments is probably not going to go anywhere. And so people disengage with them and think, why am I here again? Why am I here um, <laughs> in these rooms? The random brainstorming with you, but actually mm. your silly idea might help that person have the right solution come to the frothing up to their their consciousness and and then mm. get shared and and it's just about again being playful with people and encouraging them to kind of access the more creative side of their mm. their thinking and and that's what i love about my job and i i don't i mean i also love editing to word count um <laughs> in a way that possibly is unhealthy um but uh, and that sounds it sounds like completely different kinds of activity they are completely different kinds of activities. I think that's where you get your you, your actual sort of toil satisfaction from in those kind of jobs you know like if you're working in a garden and you sort of you've done the digging and the earth moving and you know what you've moved and you're like you know that's a good day's work I've moved that amount of earth from there to there but you don't get that in in an office what you do get is like I've got this document and I've made these changes and now everything fits and it's all neat and it's formatted. <laughs> I've spent hours on it. <laughs> well, I'm always getting like, you know, this 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 bit of the submission needs to be eight pages in the academic yeah. sense of 12 because yeah. they're just like, they would love to spend me send me 30 pages actually, but they've yeah. sent me 12 and then I help them get it down to eight. You know, if yeah. I've done that, it's beautiful, actually. Yeah, I, I get a lot of satisfaction. And I actually, I love this, the creative thinking sides of things. And I like supporting those sorts of things. But mm. I mean, I, I find social interaction very draining personally. So I always have to kind of pace myself with the amount, the balance of mm. helping support events and helping support applications and mm. um, all of the different like the people that do my role have a kind of different mix depending on what academics they're helping of like bids and you know um workshop type things um mm. i'm trying to think if we do other things I mean, we do like strategic stuff across the university a little bit as well you know like feeding in that you know these groups aren't as connected as they should be we should do a bit of work that way or mm. you know help connect people to seed funding or or externals, that's another big thing. Academics will have these ideas and eventually you'll be like, okay, so who's gonna do that at the end? Have you talked to them? Do you know who those people are? And that quite often, no, they haven't. Um, and then you go in and you find, you know, somebody wants to do like a new flood 
like a sustainable urban drainage system, mm. who would eventually build that? Who would eventually maintain that? Who would mm. own it? What are those questions? Could you think about them very early on so that you don't build something that can't actually be used anywhere? Yeah. Um, what, are you, what are you doing this for? Are you just creating a diagram to sit in a room to get dusty until someone magically finds it? Or do you want it to actually exist? If so, filled, how? Or, or even are they filling labs full of tubes of various different gravels and trickling <laughs> stuff through them and measuring what comes out? Because it's all fascinating to them, but they don't have to put it, you know, and it, yeah. And, and actually being from my Yorkshire water days, because I, I did have some time in asset planning as well, who's going to, how does that asset degrade over time? You know, like mm. um, who's going to maintain it is a huge thing. And actually yeah. maintenance, I mean, it's most work. <laughs> it, and it's the most important work and it's the most yeah. neglected thing ever. Yeah. It drives me crazy that we don't value maintenance and utilitarian yeah. thinking more because the drain the drain covers you know if they were cleared of leaves mm. when the flood water came that would be helpful <laughs> it's um, it's the consumer mentality i think sort of sweeping in it's, it's like will you just buy a new one we don't need yeah. to look after it we'll just buy a new one or will it need to be upgraded in five years anyway and we'll go so like we'll, yeah the endless landfill <laughs> no keep it in working order it's cheaper yeah well, and it's been edited, you know, like the the people who give people work to do have slowly been just like pinching it out as well. I mean, oh, don't take time for that. Don't take time for that. Don't take time for that. Or or when it when you're doing your priorities, you know, you go for the burning fire mm. and that leaves the kind of, you wouldn't get the fires if you did the maintenance, you know, yeah. you wouldn't get the burning issues if you did your standards and da, 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 da yeah. stuff properly and your standards are right you shouldn't get the big problem yeah. I mean obviously you will sometimes get big problems but you're you're kind of baking in risk when you neglect yeah. maintenance yeah and, and and when you're in academia and you're thinking about something brand new that's actually often the furthest thing from your mind because like, yeah. like when would maintenance have to come on you know like you'd have to do all your work and then it'd have to go through several other iterations and somebody would actually have to build it somewhere and then three mm. years later work out that it's failed because of you know nobody thought about maintenance until then mm. <laughs> um and when actually if you think about it early in the de design stage along with like the materials you're using and all these other things you can make mm. quite responsible innovation it just takes a a change in mindset and um, mm. you know it that's not universally happened yet but you can see among the younger generation academics that's more on their mind i don't know the degree to which they get taught about it in their course at the moment yeah and i, I do wish people got taught more around commercialization in their courses because i think that would be helpful for people we could have a nation of small businesses and everybody kind of doing mm. what they really wanted to do um mm. would be amazing actually <laughs> Mm. I mean, maybe now would be a time to talk about universal basic income because I think yeah I mean I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go on to it I mean like if you if you were on a UBI would you would that change your your position at the moment would you work less would you work more would you would you feel you had more bargaining power to kind of demand more of the university or like what what would it change for you so universal basic income would be everybody in the country gets a small amount regularly well, it, it would be i mean the way that i imagine ubi is it's, it's enough to live on so everyone's getting like a you know standard amount of enough to, wow. like a living wage sort of amount so if you got like a living wage amount every week for everybody you know some yeah. people would just save it some people would spend it some people would be forced to spend it but yeah. it would take a lot of pressure off for a lot of people and like you say in situations where people have got short-term contracts or just you know these no good contracts that are the majority of contracts these days so they can't get credit they can't buy houses they can't do anything and they can't refinance themselves either if they have got credit so yeah it would just give that kind of that breathing space so would you would you give up work <laughs> would you would you keep doing it i might start a small business actually if, if ubi yeah. came along um but actually I really like what I do as well. So I might try to go half part-time. Yeah. And but I think universal basic income would be an amazing social change to see. I would mm. love to see that in my lifetime. Because I I know a lot of musicians and artists 
who, you know, beyond, I mean, we've talked about academics and short-term contracts. I mean, yeah. to be a musician in the UK right now is such a harsh reality. Um, yeah. There's a lot of pay to play things happening in the sector. And I mean, it's just awful. So it's the only sector, well, the arts are the only sector I know where, you know, like the, the lighting person will get paid and the bar staff will get paid and the venue manager will get paid. And then they'll be like, yeah. oh, come and play for free. Come yeah. and provide the entertainment that yeah. all these people are turning up for, for yeah. free yeah. or for very little. Or we're going to try to just, you know. Oh, we'll uh, charge you for it. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Or we'll charge you for it. Yeah. yeah. The, the pleasure. Um, come around, it, we'll it, give you this opportunity for you to pay us money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just not on is it so no. um i think it would be uh, yeah universal basic income and i've also so because i know these groups of people who who are artists um some of them are musicians and painter decorators or have multiple roles that they do but they're constantly kind of like in and out of work and mm. often on the universal credit system mm. or the 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 government's uh current solution for that and you saw when the pandemic came on like people who hadn't weren't familiar with that system who suddenly mm. had to access that mm. were outraged at the value that mm. was given to them and it was mm. such an outrage that they raised the level of it for a while and now mm. they're dropping it back down it, it's mm -hmm. it's appalling and i've never actually met anyone who even if they're long-term um, benefit seekers they're still bringing a lot of societal value. They'll mm. be, in order to make it work on that level of, that small level of income, they have to be helping others and helped mm. by others. And there's like a whole kind of underlying care network that goes on within that community mm. where, you know, I mean, people feed other people and, you know, they, they wouldn't survive literally without that collaboration and you can see as an anthropologist i've seen that kind of economic where, where poverty drives that in certain places mm -hmm. and it it's just it just takes so much energy from people to exist and mm. to eat and to mm. keep shelter whereas if you had ubi you mm. would take that energy expenditure off the entire population mm. and it would probably take a few years and the commitment for that to the UBI to be decades long commitment mm. from the government. And then people would feel differently. They would make more, they would make choices that made them happier. I think, mm. you know, there would be a lot more joy. And I think we'd get mm. a lot more economic success overall as a nation. I think it would just mm. suddenly lift our productivity because mm. we would be doing the jobs that are we're suited to because we would be choosing them differently. And we would have yeah. different pressures and different drivers, but you wouldn't you wouldn't be worrying about how you're going to feed your kid, um, which a lot of people, you know, like it's a choice. Oh. You know, do I heat the house or do I eat? Um, or even be being that. ergled as much, or you know, like uh, uh, you know, what if grandma falls while I'm at work or whatever? You know, like because you have more time and people are about more. There are all these other benefits that people, you know. The, the automatic thinking is because we've been trained to think of like, oh, it's just going to cost me money. And it's like, well, okay, first of all, do you know what money is? <laughs> and, then, and then we'll go from there. But like, uh, how, how, how does it appear and where does it come from? And like, what does it mean? But uh, yeah, it's, it's just this, oh, well, it'll cost me money and, it, and, and everyone will just be layabouts. It's like, so? Well, it's much better if everyone's running around like maniacs and sitting in cars, breathing each other's car fumes. That's good, is it? This is that. That's good. Um, yeah. What do you Posit value, really? What what is a what is a positive world? What what are we all collectively like? Why are people excited about bling? Like that shouldn't be. People should be like, oh, I've got all this stuff. People should be like, you greedy so and so. <laughs> How very dare you? You know, like let's let's. This idea of equality, equality like the, Fran the French, you know, uh, liberty, equality. Mm. I can't remember the third one. Fraternity. Um, fraternity, yeah. Um, the equality thing really sticks with me. Like this, the, the, the difference between the top people in the organization and the, the bottom mm. shouldn't ever be high. The, the top people, mm. the, the MPs shouldn't get raises unless they could raise the um, 
the basic income. Else. Yeah. yeah. So, so like the top people should not be able to give themselves a raise unless they raise the whole organization. Then everybody could have a raise, mm. or they don't get one. And mm. that that's an idea, you know. That that mm. I've I've tried to suggest that before. <laughs> anyway, <but I'll>, <laughs> yeah, my my I I don't know if this is um is an appropriate thing to share, but my my exploration around Yorkshire Water of oh he wants to innovate. When I went to go, oh, when are we doing the management team? They were like, we're not doing the management team mm. <laughs> at the time. I was like, okay, they've they've changed now, but uh, yeah, that was <laughs> that at the time. I was shocked that you know, like, why would you like? Surely the management team are the most important ones who should be innovating. Mm. But yeah, <laughs> I I have a very American, very I'm I'm from the Midwest as well, and from a very. Uh, I don't know. I grew up with a very puritanical kind of naive perspective on the world that it was all democratic and that actually, even though it was the 70s, like women are equal out there somewhere. And, mm. you know, that's all happened. It's all great. Um, mm. Janesville is a little behind the time because, you know, we're a rural backwater. But out there, mm. you could, my, I very much got brought up by a single mother telling me I could do anything I wanted mm. earnestly probably once a week um, mm. and I believed her for quite a long time and that took me mm. halfway through university I was like suddenly going actually wait a minute <laughs> 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 this isn't all like I was expecting it in the big city and then I thought mm. well maybe it's just America and I went around actually you know there's still some work to be done <laughs> yeah. on some of these core core issues um, and I'm shocked that even in 2021 we've got some of the We've had some of the disasters and problems that we've we've had, but um, mm. I have been a long-term uh, emergent disease watcher. So I, I had a tracker for Ebola for a while because <laughs> mm. I was very worried that that was going to go global. I have a, mm. enough of a biology background to have a understanding that, I mean, actually we should just be grateful that the, <laughs> that the pandemic didn't hit before we had the technology to work from home so extensively mm. as we have. I know that everybody can do that, but um, you know, it could have hit in the eighties and we would have been in a very different place globally. Um, anyway, but in some yeah. ways, may, maybe that would have been better. Maybe that would have facilitated the, the, the changes that we needed to make 30 years ago that we just went, no, we're not doing that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I helped roll out WebEx for Yorkshire Water, like like video conferencing for them in like 2013. And we were the innovation team, but we were using it once a week and people didn't like it. And mm. I had to set up the meeting and I must have, I I mean, I've come to the, to, you know, the, the view that you always have kind of technical issues when you're doing these things and mm. you just persevere through them and that's how you get on. But um, yeah, I must have had every technical issue that is possible to have with WebEx, including there's no audio because there's a, a an unlabeled switch in the room that's controlling the speakers that, you know, sort of yeah. six very senior people stood around for half an hour trying to make it all work. We've mm. wasted how much money and eventually I got to the root of the problem and it was have you flipped the switch? So I, yeah. yeah, I then went and put a big sign above it, like this controls the speakers, kind of like so nobody else had to go through that. But yeah, you know, I imagine, you know, everybody's been having to do that a bit these past few years, and it's tiring to kind of people underestimate how tiring change is. It's literally physically exhausting. Mm. People underestimate how how impactful low level stress is like a mild concern that you might get COVID and that might, you know, you might not be able to get food for yourself because you might live alone or, you know, all the sorts of problems that come with just even having the COVID. Um, you know, that kind of holding that low level stress is very impactful for people. And I've, I've met loads of people who have not even had COVID, but you feel like they have brain fog, I think possibly yeah. because we've, we've all been in this state for, you know, perpetually now for well, quite a while. Did we did a big global experiment in like house arrest and solitary confinement <laughs> and that's yeah. going to have an effect on society and 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 I don't I don't think people appreciate really that like some for some people that is really restful and like I've 
I got a dog in February um, mm. of 2020. So literally just before dogs became unavailable to the world <laughs> mm. um, because there were so many people trying to get them. Um, but uh, I've, I've really enjoyed a lot of my time. Um, mm. I've been able to work from home. I mm. had done dialing in before. So what, that wasn't new to me. I had worked uh, with people across the globe collaboratively from the UK, mm. you know, and I thought I would be okay. And, and I've even had some kind of stressful times, but I've seen other people and other, not everybody is as um, introverted as, as I am happy, you know, I'm happy to poodle around and mm. paint or play piano or do whatever, um, surf, surf Twitter. Um, but um, my friends that are more sociable have, have found it exhausting because you, you recharge your battery in one of two ways. Typically as a human, you either go and seek social interaction and that boosts you, or you go and seek a bit of solitude and that boosts you and people, mm. I mean, it's a continuum, but you know, the people on either end, uh, the introverts have just, you can see it on Twitter, like mm. loads of conversations about how, how pleasant lockdown has been as a comparator mm. to how, the expectation of social engagement that the normal mm. before had gotten to. Mm. And I'm hoping that we can go forward and, and kind of have a happy balance. But my poor friends that are extroverts and recharged through other people have mm. had a really, yeah, I've been feeling really bad for some of them, but um, mm. they're getting, you know, it's better now, but um, it's- I, uh, think, I, yeah. I think it's underestimated, I, like the, I think it's kind of a bit of too much over-focus on, you know the the individual experiences and not enough focus on the collective experience of like that we all went through it you know the majority of us went through it um and it's it's kind of it it, it seems to have been diverted into oh well you know mine was okay but it, it's kind of like mine was okay I enjoyed a lot of it and like in my opinion I think we should do the lockdowns more regularly like I think because you don't have that space. Like when I, I grew up in the eighties and nineties and stuff, and you know, like even in the mid nineties here, most things were closed on Sunday. You know, you know I, if you if if you didn't work Mondays and you had a Sunday night off, if you hadn't gone to the off license and got your booze in already, you finished late or whatever. That was it. You were just bored. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, and and boredom's horrible, but the it it's a space to create. You know. Boredom is good for the soul. Is it? People don't have enough boredom at the moment. They always on their phone, like the, the yeah. youth don't have enough. You definitely, we could all do with a little more boredom because mm. eventually it peters out and you're doing something and you're like, oh, you know, yeah. like the boredom leads to you helping yourself find what you need. I think sometimes yeah. we don't, we don't, I mean, some people do, but we don't typically let ourselves get bored yeah things where we, we see it as a very negative state but I think it's it's kind of it's kind of a it's a secret thing you know like um, yeah it's underestimated if, if you leave some kids or or people alone and they don't have any stimulus they'll play eventually like Emma was saying you know you just leave the kids with some stuff they'll 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 be playing with it 20 minutes later um and they'll be having a great time potentially I mean it can be more complicated than that particularly I don't think kids these days are as used to self-creating their own, but very yeah. young children just do it naturally. Like, you know, yeah. You never, yeah. It's kind of like being spoon fed and then, and, and then unfortunately you end up just kind of copying what you've done, which is good. You, that's kind of how you find your voice in the creative process of like, when you start copying something that you like. Yeah. But I do think it's a bit of a loop where you're just kind of recreating the same things. And I think, you know, we need to create more and more spaces for new things. Yeah, and and also not always about like I I come from a quilting community, and um, I pretty much like my grand watched me a lot when I was little. I grew up underneath a quilt, like you know, hanging out, looking up at the the underneath side of things. You can it's, it's very lovely kind of idyllic childhood, but um, there's a lot to be said from how that process and that craft. Is maintained and like with quilting you quite often have people that do a patchwork top and then you had this set of ladies often in a church 
who were very good at the quilting, which is the sewing layers together. So you have your mm -hmm. piece and then you have a, a layer of wadding and then you have a bottom piece and they put it on this big seven foot square frame and they're all sat around doing, they've drawn a pattern on and they're all sat around, it's very sociable, doing their little stitches and they, they charge the person by the amount of yards of thread that they consume off the spool. So how many spools of thread did they use to do what they did? Yeah. So it's kind of way of measuring the hourly rate. And then yeah. that money tends to go into the church. But you see that there's these group projects and they would all critique what they were doing as they sat and did it usually, particularly if none of them had made the one they were working on, you know, somebody yeah. just brought it in. Oh, you know, oh, they've done a beautiful job with this or, oh, it's a shame they didn't do that or, you know, and, and you can see this, like, we don't have a lot of group projects that we contribute to necessarily. So I've done work like mm -hmm. upcycling fabrics in communities or, you know, in community arts kind of um, environments and used to help with, uh, help set up at the library, a kind of craft night. So like once a month people would come in and we'd use the books at the library or we'd have some set up for whatever craft was going to be happening on the side and then mm. we'd have somebody who knew how to do it just voluntarily sort of talking about it for five or ten minutes and then everybody would just use some waste material and make something and the, the kind of conversations that come up during that and again I think Emma mentioned this you know you get people busy with their hands and they remember get all sorts of oh we used to do this this way and mm. oh you know, I've never, you know, so you've got, and you've got a whole range of generations mm. and it's, it's magic. It, it's mm. really special. The kinds of conversations you can have over a little project or a group project that they're all contributing to that then they don't even, they're not even worried about how good they, what a good job they do on it or how successful mm. it is because it's them learning a skill and it's very absorbing. And I, mm. I just think it switches your mindset a little bit. I had a friend who came in and he was, he had a small business and he was, he came in to work with Yorkshire Waters leadership team and he had them throwing bowls, literally li like juggle. He was juggling and then go catch that. So we're going to stand in a circle and you all are in suits and I'm going to throw balls and you're going to catch them and throw them onto somebody else. And we're going to mm. say a word or something, you know, mm. and it was using theater improv techniques with business people. And he now does mm. it with medics and, and sort of, all sorts of other folks I haven't caught up with him for ages but it was great I mean and I was still there thinking well I have theater improv background I could have done this we didn't have to hire this other person in to do this but if I had mm. gone in and told that senior leadership team to get in a circle and I was going to throw balls at them they would have not yeah. taken it you know because yeah. I worked within the organization there's a weird thing with consultants being able to come in and say things quite often things that the senior people are like we'd like you to come in and find this, the evidence for this, this, this direction we want to go in, go look for the evidence. And then they come mm. in and talk to everybody and everybody. Yeah. Either... Everybody in the company is saying this already and we're just not listening to it, but we brought someone in. Oh, and they've said it. Oh, so it must be true now. Yes. <laughs> or everybody in the company is saying something different. Yeah. And we don't want to go that way. So we bring in a consultant and, and then and then there's the art of the consultant. Which way are they going to go? How, how much of this that everybody's saying that they don't want is going to make it through to, like, could you actually please listen? Mm. Um, but there could just be more, more communication differently done within organizations. Might be helpful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. <laughs> what, what I'll touch on next, we'll, uh, we'll do Brexit and then we'll do climate change. I don't think we need to really cover covid unless there's anything sort of especially that you want to say about it because I, you know you mentioned that you were working from home i would imagine that the university was fairly ahead of the government if not bang on exactly what they say yeah but you know like some of them would have been like we'll be preparing for a close down and the second that they said that they were closing down i would imagine that they kind of went into close down as much as they could and i would imagine there were some exemptions for like you know looking after the all that property <laughs> um that was a bit of a nightmare but yeah 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 i can imagine I mean, the states had yeah a terrible time <laughs> and it was when when they were opening it back up and there were there were legionella problem across a lot of i mean i don't know how bad it was at leeds uni but the, a lot of the universities estates had discovered that they you know your water systems need maintenance yeah even if people aren't in the building yeah but yeah yeah 
Um, so Brexit then? Yeah, let's do Brexit. <laughs> Is it going to affect your work? Like, has it already affected your work? It's already affected my work. Um, and uh, I applied for UK citizenship in 2016, just before the vote, because mm. I just, I'm very committed to living in the UK. Um, and, uh, and I was worried about the vote and people told me I was being silly and then it happened. And yeah, I'm incredibly disappointed uh, at not being part of Europe officially. Um, mm. And uh, and the university overall, I mean, the UK universities do very well out of, uh, or mm. historically have done very well out of the European funding Horizon 2020. We're mm. we're a very important piece of that puzzle, um, and and working collaboratively across you know Europe and the UK mm. was a really brilliant thing, and we. It does seem like we're going to be able to continue doing that so mm. there was a lot of concern that we wouldn't and that would have a big financial impact on us i mean i think in some research is only a proportion of the income that universities get they get more mm. from students um but of that research funding you know sometimes 30 percent of it can be european um and for some groups and and types of research it can be more than that and and so there's always that there's that risk and it immediately impacted us because collaborators collaborators didn't really want to take a risk sometimes or some of them didn't um i didn't have that personally or with the groups that i support but anecdotally the amount of applications that we you know as a country put into the eu funding dropped um i think over that time period but i think we we maintained a, a good success rate and yeah. It looks like we're going to be going forward still part of the research europe <laughs> or you know your europe's research initiatives so yeah i mean it is it's just very very sad and uh i don't i don't i i can't think of anything to say about it but it doesn't yeah. just make me want to cry frankly so. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Okay, I didn't well, I didn't make good use of being in the UK before Brexit. So I didn't travel. I, I was thinking I might travel yeah. around Europe more later. And and now I'm probably not going to. <laughs> but um yeah, there you go. Mm. It's uh it is what it is. And I guess I wish our political system weren't so or the the I wish people weren't so divided, you know. I, I wish that the people who had voted for but if we uh, weren't divided, we might look at the people with all the money and go, why have you got all the money? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it just doesn't, it, I don't see any good really coming from it for anybody. No. So, no. Um, or, any, or any better decisions being made. Like, you know, we'll go from this, this stupid decision to the next stupid decision to the next stupid decision. And I'm massively worried about environmental standards because Europe did yeah, and clean up our waterways. Done. Yeah. I mean, European legislation drove improvements across the mm. water treatment network that have led to, you know, different species yeah. returning to rivers they once swam in that the Industrial Revolution had pushed them out of, you know, like yeah. it, it's been incredible. And and cleaned up all our beaches like the beaches were you know there, there was articles just about you know like unsavory to even go on like the health risks and that that changed i mean it'll all change back now but um you know um, that 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 was a big change it it might not you know i think there's a there's a commitment i can't see among... them i can't see the government being committed to regulating on it though or spending the money they might regulate but they won't they won't police it they won't spend the money on it they kind of will have to because if they don't it will be a health risk like it, i don't think they care <laughs> because the population growth has gone yeah i mean they don't they don't regulate things that effectively now so yeah there will always be some problems but i mean actually we we can look at it two ways we can be like oh they're going to erode the standards or we can be like mm. actually we could be i kind of like this idea of beta britain 
you know, like mm. we could be the test bed for new cool stuff and for higher standards mm. and for doing things the right way and lead the mm. world. And if we can implement it here on this quite discreet island, then it's very much something, you know, we've scaled it up to this size. We can mm. parcel that out and sell it to the rest of the world a little bit, you know, or like mm. come do your trial here, mm. you know, um, maybe not everybody's idea of something that would be good, but um, I would like us to be that, you know, we're pretty, it's overall the UK has got a, a reputation for being innovative, just not a reputation for commercializing the innovation. So mm. you know, historically, I think color chemistry, you know, like there's been advances. A lot of the advances have actually been made by researchers here in the UK historically, mm. and mm. then like commercialized by German researchers or other people or Americans mm. or what have you. Um, and there's there's something cultural about that that I haven't quite pegged. Um, mm. but I think Yorkshire is a good example. You know, like we kind of just get on with stuff and we'll like, you know, you don't necessarily, we don't like brilliant stuff is happening, but we're not mm. talking about the brilliant stuff all the time. We're usually, mm. like, well, you know, whatever. Um, we're not good at self-promotion. Mm. Uh, I don't know whether that's a UK wide thing or not, or whether that's part of it, you know, like, um, yeah, and, and having that kind of commercial mindset, maybe, I mean, maybe it's part of why I like the UK is that it has more of the innovative and entrepreneurial mindset at times, mm. but just that early stage of it, and then they don't really make the money very successfully out of it. <laughs> I kind of like to think that I could help bridge that, you know, we could do a little bit of both, we could have a bit yeah. more um, financial success, and we could maintain our, you know, our position as as a leader across these different things that we're quite, you know, we seem to be. Have been I think we're at. historically very bad at investing in things, investing in our future, or investing in stuff in general. Um, you know, you you hear a lot of like stories of British companies, or or at least the legends that people tell each other of like oh, well, they were really good and they were the best in the world, but then they didn't, you know, and then someone else bought them out. And you know, all sorts of people get blamed for, like, it's somebody else's fault. But it's, it's like, no, it's, it's, it's cultural. They're, like they're, it, People just want to extract as much rent from a thing and, you know, and then that's it. Yeah. They're like, if it, if it dies, it dies, and they go and buy some other asset and rinse that. Yeah. And it's not Maybe enough it's thinking about, like like we say, maintaining and, and, but investing as well, you know, making it better and making it keep happening. When, when I first came here, I was a little dubious of the royal family. Um, you know, I, I, partly the people I was hanging out with were not very fond of them and for a number of reasons. And I think they have their problems. But one thing I do see as a benefit of having a royal family is actually, they are really invested in the future of the country for very personal reasons, but you know, it's in their best interest for us to not pollute our water to the point that it's very expensive to treat it in order to serve it to the population. They're very, you know, they, they will have a harder time in the future if we mess things up. And you can kind of see that influencing their behavior already. And mm. they, they seem to have in recent years really shifted, you know, they're, they're wearing the same outfits more than once. I mean, that doesn't sound like it should be outrageous, but that's that's a big change for the rich people to do, you know. Um, and and it's good to they're trying to be seen to do that kind of thing. And I think it, you know, actually, it, with political systems, you get very driven around four years or you know yeah. whatever time unit that people yeah. are in post for, and they they see quick wins but they don't understand what the long-term consequences of those quick wins would be. Like when the Tories came in and just wiped out the development, regional development authorities and mm. didn't seem to appreciate what they were doing within mm. the community and, oh, we'll just save some money there. Well, you've just taken out decades worth of effort, you know, in one not, fell it's, swoop. It's never saving any money though, is it? It's yeah. like, have you, have you got your spoils from Iraq yet? Like, you know, have we got... Um, like where where our Brexit benefit or whatever you yeah, know like where's the NHS savings? bus yeah, where, where where's the money that's come back to us from all this saving in austerity when we tightened our belts mm -hmm. like oh oh can we see any of it no we can't we need the, that and that comes back to maintenance and the stitch in time and mm. doing the little things 
effectively and valuing that people do those things like that's it there's no value placed in doing your admin we've gotten rid of the secretaries you know like we, there's there's very little value placed in in doing things the right way um yeah it's it's a weird one isn't it i i haven't seen my brexit spoils yet other than it's spoiled a lot of things um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there, there should, I mean, again, like, if you have better community care, you have less pressure on the NHS, but we've just mm. spent the last sort of, you know, I don't know how many years, um, sort of scraping out the community care and the, the I, I think if you take care of the, it, like a reflection of the civilization and the degree to which you're civilized is to me embodied by having free healthcare because that you, that's universally available mm. and is utilitarian. You know, you mm. shouldn't be necessarily going to get something fancy done in the NHS, mm. you, you know, something unnecessary, but the medically required stuff you should have as a basic accessible thing. And I, I've been amazed by the NHS since I've been here. I grew up somewhere where, you know, my mom personally would not go and seek medical care because it would cost too much money and she, mm would know that so she sometimes had to take me as a child um and it was it was a huge thing you know we grew up in a very poor way and and i never wanted and i don't think any civilization should have its populace in that position like you say universal basic income health care education should actually be free and i think you can see transport so as well the tax that's been put onto industry has just dropped away since the yeah. 50s. And I felt some of that, and, 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 and you got sponsorship creeping in. So you, yeah. you, you replaced the money that you used to get given somehow through you know, sponsorship and advertising and being bombarded with stuff to buy. That's not yeah. necessarily, it's, it's, not, it's not been a win for anybody. Yeah. Um, we need, I mean, yeah, there's a, been a lot of people write a lot of, beautiful words about these kinds of problems and been yeah. really inspiring to me and I don't even know if I would have noticed the degree of, of change if it hadn't been for some of those books that I've read but yeah. I mean it just uh it it beggars belief that anybody sees that as progress but maybe there's a you know we're talking about culture of innovation versus culture of commercialization maybe the the wealthy and elitist culture in the UK is a slightly different one than the mm. utilitarian problem solving, more entrepreneurial, eccentric. There's some eccentric mm. posh people, but mm. I think a lot of the innovation actually happens from the the, the lower or the, the other parts of society, not from mm. the the people who don't even have to work because they've got that much money. They're not well, really yeah. inventing things. The necessity is the mother of invention, sort of you know austerity yeah. um so maybe like that sort of make do and mend isn't it as of like all right well we've got to fight got to fight off these people we've got six pots and pans and an elastic band what can we do yeah yeah <laughs> and, and and you you manage it but you then don't commercialize it because you don't have mm. capital and, mm. and then somebody else in another culture where there's not such a, a gap between mm. the bottom and the top maybe or maybe there's something else happening there that makes it something that they can commercialize and we just have lost it at that point i mean we did the same thing with graphene didn't we you know it's the color mauve when it was developed the, the purple com color chemistry mm. stuff was is a really good example but yeah it's time and time again when you see repeated patterns like that you think ah there's something bigger going on here i just don't know mm. quite what it is <laughs> well that's the yeah again we 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 our attention is drawn to the particular when it should be on the, you know, the overall. Yeah. Um, the um, culture versus yeah. the, the individual. And like, there are some things we could do that and, would make And the history as well. Like I, the, the, the news seems to, it, like it's a decontextualizing machine. It, it's like, this thing's not connected to this thing. This thing's not connected to this thing. This thing's not connected to this thing. None of these things are connected and they're all just happening now. It's like, yeah, but all of your stories are always the same. The narratives are always the same. You, like, even when you encounter something new, you basically end up forcing it into one of these narratives. Yeah. 
and 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 we're presented as that as this is how the world is the world is a load of disconnected things that's always the same story and it's like that is not the world uh, we've got our blinders on don't we well they, um, they, that's the thing i think when people when we when we're in a screen when we're looking at a screen from a tv or to this screen or whatever that's when we're in the virtual world like we don't have to have the cyber helmet on we're in a virtual reality we're we're dealing with like fakeness and, it, and flashing lights and attention and shiny things and none of it's real you know it presents itself as real but it's not you, you turn it off and you look out your window and that's real and that's that's what's going on so I, I've mentioned this a couple of times about the pandemic where you hear this sort of like you know you're looking in the screen and it's like oh everyone's at death oh everything's falling apart it's all terrible you look out your window it's just the birds singing and like the street hasn't changed it's looked the same for pretty much 30 years you know <laughs> campus has been taken over by rabbits <laughs> <laughs> at one point particularly <laughs> yeah because i've got this little dog and i live so close by i i have gone up to campus even when it was closed and yeah, yeah. it's just it's just been, and actually I've seen more foxes. I don't know if it's because I'm out more, but mm. I have a feeling that the rabbit population exploded as explosion has contributed to the, the yeah. increase in fox numbers. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, I mean, and actually we should all be, I mean, it's, and there are ways to connect those two worlds and that's quite mm. a special place as well, the kind of blended mm. places. But um, we should also, I mean, the, the, there'd be so much value in, in changing the educational system globally so it there mm. were some globally common things that maybe everybody mm. could you know learn um about basic nutrition and healthcare and you know um sanitation and whatnot um mm. i had really underestimated before i worked with uh, barbara evans and, and some of the people up, up at the uni i mean i worked for yorkshire water but i hadn't really thought about how you know like in in some places, if you don't have access to toilets, you don't get girls going to schools because, mm. you know, they've got a monthly issue that they don't really, mm. they need a really fairly private place and safe and mm. secure place. And, and then you've lost the education of half your populace yeah. right there. Um, and, and it's like little tweaks to barriers like that are really important. But I wish we would teach kids. My gran taught me all the local names of all of the local plants. And we would just wander around once a day or once every few days. And, you know, as the seasons changed, pointing out the seasonal change and how the different things changed over time and mm. catching insects and sometimes killing insects and <laughs> um, pinning them to boards with their names. Uh, I would take photos these days, but, um, but, you know, like if you don't know the name of something, you're not gonna notice when it stops being there potentially mm. you're not going to be able to tell anybody that you're not seeing that thing anymore in the local mm. environment and it could go without anybody even blinking their eye and we're not mm. valuing some things that are fundamental to our existence but like mm. if you want fresh air and clean water and you don't want to have to like pay ex you know phenomenal prices mm. And just only the rich people can have fresh air and clean water. And I don't, mm. I don't think the rich, the, the very wealthy kind of understand some of no, that. No, they don't get like it. If they screw up the whole system, yeah, they, they are not going to survive that process. Yeah. No amount no. of money is going to buy them no. clean air that's going to not kill them. <laughs> and, and we need to be off that track. We need to be looking at things from a completely different perspective. Not, and, and we can still have growth because like, if you look at like a sustainable, if you look at a, a rainforest, and it's got all this diversification and growth and niche mm. richness. We've been almost like going towards weed mentality for quite a long time, you know, fast growing, quick cropping, blah, blah, blah. Mm. What we want is an old forest mentality, like a 50 year, 100 year, 150 year concept of time. And I've had people be like, oh, no, it's a long term thing. And I'm like, what do you mean it's a long term thing? It's two years. Two years is mm. not long term. It's mm. not even a lifetime. Some sectors have to think about long term. Like if you're in forestry, you have to think about decades. You have to mm. plant trees that you won't even be alive when they get harvested. Yeah. You know, and you have to do that or your business is not sustainable. Um, yeah. And and, you know, it, and again, that's my was my royal family point, kind of like if they, I think they the penny has dropped for them that if they don't 
make an intervention now, soon, in a fairly dramatic way, you know, we're not going to have, we're not going to survive. They're not, their family is not going to have a, a, a country to rule over because it's just all going to disintegrate. I mean, mm. that's, that's a worst case scenario, but it, you know, we are headed down a worst case well, path. We're, so. Yeah, we're already on that path. Yeah. Yeah. And it's already really, you know, we are buffered somewhat by being in the UK, um, but, you know, yeah, climate but, change is affecting all of us already. <laughs> yeah. And, and Absolutely. like the issues with the supply, you know, it's like everything hides everything else, but the issues with the supply chain as well, they're, they, you know, they're connected. And the, the issues with the type of resources that you're going to have access to also connected, you know, because of the quality of them descend and descend. As so our ability to generate energy descends, as all of these things that are already like as much as Brexit was a was a shock or whatever, it, it's part of a continuing process throughout this century of us collapsing. Yeah. Like, like as far as I'm concerned, it was like the 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 pandemic was kind of like, oh well, we've hit pause and the world's changed and there's all these sort of changes and then we come back to it. And there's this expectation of like, you know, back to back to normal or whatever the stupid expression was. But um, you come back to it and people are surprised of like, oh, this thing's still falling apart. Yeah, it was falling apart before. It's still falling apart and we're still not going to do anything about it. Yeah. And, and, and pre-pandemic normal was not good. You know, it was no, a bad place. Awful. There were people who are homeless. There are people who, you know, there's there's a lot that. Well, the, um, changing. the discourse was was terrible you know it, it's just sort of people think that they can go back to not just pre-pandemic but sort of pre-brexit pre-crash sort of like you know this kind of I suppose back to the globalist ideal of like the 90s and the you know the long 90s into the 2000s of just like it's all shiny and we can all make money forever and it's all great and groovy and that's where we all actually live there was a little space, wasn't there, between when the Berlin Wall fell mm. before the Twin Towers got hit. Mm. And there's like that little, I think it's a decade or, or nearly a decade. And yeah, that was quite a special era in a way. There was hope, you know, mm. there, was, there was a different kind of hope that things mm. could go well, I think. Um, but yeah, the, the house, yeah. I mean, but, but, you know, people don't, people cast back their mind to places and they have this rose tinted memory of it. And I don't, mm. I don't really buy into that too much. I think, you know, there was quite a lot of, frankly, weird stuff happening back then as well. Oh, and, yeah, and yeah. Stuff. Um, yeah. But, you know, going forward, we have such a special opportunity. We shouldn't just try to rebuild what was there before, like when the fire of London happened and they pretty much were like, uh, rebuild what was there before, I think, um, is, is what I've seen. Um, or that's quite often the case when you have a fire in an urban area, you know, it takes out a bit. And then they historically would just do what had been there um, and replicate it. But actually, we could, we have so much potential for change and growth and either very good or very bad things happening. And there's so much uncertainty. And people aren't, I don't think people are, most people are very comfortable with high levels of uncertainty that we're going to be going through in the next few years. Well, it's they'll going to have be to, very tough. Well, they'll just have to deal with it. <laughs> the, the time for having a choice is over and they made the wrong one. So <laughs> it's kind or of their logistic. government, their elected officials have made the wrong one, whether they voted for them or not, you know? Mm. Yeah. It's not, it's not my fault. It's not your well, fault. We don't have much power in this scenario, right? We, we, yeah contributed certain we can do what we can but we need people who we need ways of demanding that the people that are in charge do more of the right things something they've been doing <laughs> yeah yeah there's not good um routes for escalating change like that is there really in any society that i've seen um there's a lot of you know young people start off wanting change and then by the time they get older they're kind of like get embedded in the status quo of it well you get institutionalized don't you and and you get worn down worn to the down. point of well it's just easier to agree with with this set of ideals pick your fire or pick pick your battles sort of only the mm. ones you can win yeah yeah i don't know do you think do you think we kind of we've kind of touched on climate change enough or should we go into a, like an actual discussion on it or because oh, i don't want to I, I also don't want to take you into a path of like 
I, I want to try and bring it back up to something happy again. I don't want to spend too much time on being negative. Yeah. I don't want to put you in a bad mood for the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah. I don't think climate change is going to cheer me up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, you must see from an academic side, you must see some exciting projects kind of coming along to tackle it. And that, that must be kind of interesting. And there is, uh, and again, and there is lots of stuff happening. I mean, there are literally millions of people around the world working really hard on this and there needs to be a lot more and so on and the, the major obstacle is our leaders and our you know like the people with the power of the people who were in the way and the people that keep presenting to us this sort of like nihilistic like nothing's happening nothing can be done kind of thing which I've just you know reiterated myself <laughs> yeah yeah but I think um, it's, it swings between you know like like bleakness and joy doesn't it um hmm. I think I, I mean, I think my perspective on climate change is actually, it's the economically, it's its the only solution is, is kind of trying to address climate change and move to net zero is, is the only economically viable path. And there's a lot of people saying, oh, it's gonna to cost too much money. Well, if you look at the alternative is global death, I don't think any amount of yeah. money is too much money. So, uh, so how much is extinction worth doing for then? Like preventing yeah. it? <laughs> uh, you know, let's just pack it in, you know, like, yeah, yeah, go, yeah. We have, go have your whatever and live. Yeah, we haven't come up with an idea or a project. There's nowhere for us to go. We're, uh, we're spent as a force. We may as well just give up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so to me, it's like, it is the only option. And I'm, I'm forever kind of like, uh, I don't know why, but I, I often find myself a few years or a few decades ahead of like where things are going. And I'm going like, well, that's obvious. You know, as a kid, I remember going through, we used to recycle the, the bottles. Like um, I used to enjoy recycling the bottles. It was some task I got set to do, you know, get the bottles ready. We're going to the grocery store. And then we went over to plastic ones and they didn't, like I could taste the plastic was leaching into the product and I didn't like the flavor as much. and I didn't understand and I would be like well what do we do with these things that we're throwing what happens to the stuff we throw away people don't like like people aren't taught to appreciate that full cycle you know what happens when you flush your toilet you know does it, that's an important thing that everybody should know I've I've been chided at sadly social parties for going into this topic at great length <laughs> but um you know I think it's it's vital and and I'm shocked every time I meet somebody who doesn't know or have any interest in in that sort of the whole loop of things I've, I think I, that's kind of a bit of a childish you know it's, it's like a childlike mentality of like daddy you know mummy and daddy have taken care of that of like well have they what what's happened you know where yeah. is it's gone your responsibility is now absolved you know yeah but I think every class should you know and we got taken to like a I think a cheese making place when we were kids um we, we should have gone to a landfill or sewage mm. works or both um mm. at some point I mean the smell for one thing is unforgettable mm. the smell of the cheese place was unforgettable as well um and I did not enjoy that but you know I learned, <laughs> I learned quite a lot and a farm and again farm smell incredible um <laughs> as a as a kid who doesn't grow up on a farm all kids should go to farms and I mean mm. kids don't know that baking comes from pigs you know mm. we're our educational system at the kind of beginning years is somehow failing us if kids don't understand mm. where their food comes from and I know like places like groundwork have done a lot of and and the university gets involved in some of these projects as well of like you know implementing things that will help kids understand because you, mm. you really have to get the whole population on a basic mm. level about some things and I would like to think you know food would be one of them and that growing you know growing food at school on the school grounds mm. would be a good thing that all, all kids all, all schools should have a little allotment plot patch we should all learn how to grow some food especially you know? now when some of us might have to <laughs> yeah yeah and 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 especially now when you know actually there's a lot of benefit in not having to ship food around and like mm. you know yeah there's there's a lot of i mean climate th th there's so many interlocked problems with climate change that i think it becomes overwhelming sometimes and i i come back to i had a, a i have a chronic illness and at one point it was very 
disruptive to my life. And mm. I spent several years keeping a food diary and trying interventions and various things. And then it occurred to me that I had had times in my life when I had been healthy, even though I've had this illness mm. all my life, it was un undiagnosed for a while. And what kinds of things, what were the common characteristics of those points in times when I was healthy? And then I went back and like, without questioning it, just implemented some of those things, you know, so mm. reduced my, my commute and I slept differently and a few other tweaks and, and I felt a lot better. And it's like, we've got a natural world, everything that we make or create or new product or everything we kind of go through this test of like, is it, is it in sympathy with the natural world we live in? You know, does it, mm. Does it, is it by, is its byproduct water or is its byproduct, you know, something that's going to pollute the atmosphere mm. and, and then, and then make a, a system for prioritizing the things that are going to make a, and that's how you would get your, your rich forest growth in my mind is mm. you would, you would optimize and, and, and prioritize and fund and encourage the things that were more sympathetic and as, and, 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 and socially kind of you know, culturally talk those things up and and talk up e equality across people. Because you know, actually mm. inequality just rips everything apart, you know? Mm. I mean, the rich are only, and the rich and powerful are only in their position because we, the poor, let them. There's a lot mm. more of us poor people than there are rich. Mm. And frankly, if we collectively got our act together and didn't want them to be there anymore, we could make that happen. And it's happened in the past. I'm not mm. trying to advocate for that in any way, but you know, they need to say that, see that, you know, if if we become so bleak, if mm. our lives become so bleak and and ruined by climate change, we will mm. make some kind of big change. And that might they, they should maybe choose a path that they can stand now. Mm. So that they don't get something, you know, implemented on them later. <laughs> mm. I mean, like more and more, you kind of feel that, uh, you know, until a bunch of rich people die somewhere, they're not going to change any of their thinking until they actually think, oh, yes, they can do this. I mean, like the other thing to remember is we mentioned the Berlin Wall coming down before. And I, and I love it as an example of like, well, nobody saw that happening. Nobody saw it coming. The CIA were totally taken by surprise by it. It's just like, you don't know what's going to happen. Like the the whole world is a powder keg, and we don't know what the spark is going to be. And hopefully, the spark is not into into war that we can't do because <laughs> nuclear weapons. <laughs> but like, but we, you can't just hope for this magical change. You've got to be working on on actually doing stuff, haven't you? Is the thing. Yeah. It's part of why I'm talking to you. You know, <laughs> like actually, I think. Part of the solution is in the social media and in the, the technologies that we despise yeah. them in some ways, but actually they are connecting everyday people about yeah. everyday things and people yeah. are starting to see the, the artifice fall away a little bit. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, wait, I can see I can see that happening on TV. Like Friends is a great example. Like I could never watch Friends because my brain is just sat there going like, she works in a coffee house and lives in that apartment. <laughs> She works in a coffee house. They work, they do these jobs, but they live in that apartment and they never seem to have any stress. And mm. I just don't under, you know, like, and I would get so stuck on that. I would just be like, I, I can't, I can't, there's no comedy here for me. Cause I just like, it's not realistic <laughs> in any way. And Americans tend to do that with their dramas. Like we make it rich people having dramatic. And, and then I came here and I was like, Oh, East Enders. That's very different. It's, you mm. know what I mean? Like it's, mm. it's, it's much grittier, really. Mm. Like there's there's a more there's more realist. And so and, and as I've traveled, you know, I sometimes meet people and they're like, oh, you grew up in America. It must have been like, and then they're yeah. like, they've got this image of, of what things are like. And I'm like, actually, no, I grew up in a rural area and we had a day off school for hunting season every year. And I had I was one of the few people with a single parent, you know. Um, and we, you know, we lived in poverty and we didn't have any social we didn't have any network for health systems and mm. i've had to you know got into hawk over my education it's a broken system that nobody should be following mm. <laughs> america you know and and i think subsequently it's become more obvious to the rest of the world that america is a broken system that's crumbling away mm. we are all kind of fighting that entropy 
Oh, it's become it more apparent to Americans as well, hasn't it? And of like, you know, it's yeah. scary. <clears throat> you know, maybe if we're all kind and we all do what we can for carbon, and mm. you know, we we because of we live in the system, we I mean, we can't phase out plastics because we just don't have an option for alternative mm. for some mm. of it. But you know, actually. About a hundred years ago, when we had little corner shops and they didn't have things individually packaging, you're getting those little bulk buy shops back now. You know, mm. we we can take some lessons from the past. We don't have to make all new stuff. We did mm. used to live in in more harmony with nature. Mm. We we can take some innovation and some some older ways of working and marry those things together and have that future that we all want that we don't mm. know quite what it looks like but we know what it doesn't look like i think yeah my point is like we need to stop doing the things we know are negative and start mm. to explore some of those but it's it's not that's not an individual decision that's not an, an individual level that's at a big organizational mm. level and a government level the politicians really have to stand up or we're all sunk. It's mm. like, I don't want to have to put all my faith in the politicians doing things right, but they really do drive change on the ground with organizations. They put policies oh, yeah, in with, place. Yeah. That's when stuff gets bought and changed and happens. And you yeah. suddenly, instead of having a system that, you know, while you're doing the maintenance on it, maintenance on it, it's throwing sewage out into the world because it's not mm. working to something where you've got duty standby. So when mm. you're maintaining this one, you're running it you know, you're still getting your treatment through the other one. And Europe helped us do that, but we could, we don't need to be in Europe in order to keep doing that kind of quality improvement. We could just be like, we want Britain to be the coolest place. Mm. And we want to be the innovative leader of, of how climate stuff happens, you know, how this transformation, mm. we want to evidence through what we do that there are green jobs. And there are so many green jobs actually we're not going to need the oil jobs anymore. <laughs> you know, mm. it's going to lead to some individuals retraining, but mm. um, overall, there'll be a benefit. And yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, I think we have to go through some more weird political things first, I think. And, and yeah. but genuinely, I genuinely think that like, you know, the society has to kind of be, be throw backwards and forwards a bit more to kind of, what am I trying to say here? I mean, this is one of the things as well. I still think that, what we're, you know, like you were saying before of, of following the fog lights, we've got, we haven't, we haven't got a roadmap. We haven't got like a, a model of what it looks like. We, we don't even really have the vocabulary for it yet. Like it, it's, it's so hard to deal with because you can't really talk about what it should be. And, and quite often, you, you know, the closest you can get to it is someone who's, you know, being like your typical stereotypical environmentalist who's been vegan and so on and this that and the other or the, oh, the middle, yeah or the yeah. middle class like consumer who's buying all the the green watched kind of stuff of like you know I'm, I'm doing good now but I think there's 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 a path through that's you know that would please you, you kind of traditional conservative and please you kind of old school socialist of, of like more community and more more stuff happening nearby and more things being carried on you know like more traditions because we have to have these traditions because of this that and the other but that doesn't mean that we have to entirely sacrifice you know like ourselves back to duty and so on like we can still because you need to go out into the world to learn things to bring back like surely isn't that what the hero myth is all about isn't that what we should be doing anyway yeah although you could do some of that uh, that adventuring online these days you know like yeah. um the, and and that's that's i think where i'm like yeah you could marry the 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 potential for marrying the technology and the i mean and there have been we do have some roadmaps you know there have been cultures that have lived in sustainable ways with their environment and harmoniously improved that environment i mean even in the uk i mean you all put in uh your sheep walls at one point in time and kicked a lot of people off of land and that sort of at the beginning of the industrialization yeah. but those fields they need some of them need to have the farming activity in order to maintain the biodiversity now because mm. it was 
done in a way that was appreciative and over so much time, such, you know, a, a, compl a complex old forest type richness grew up in those spaces. Mm. And now we have to do those old traditional practices in order to maintain that. But that's not, that's not rewilding. That's, that's, you know, maintaining that interim. It's mm. biodiversity. The biodiversity is rich, but we helped make make it happen and it only stays rich mm. if we continue that practice so there's like a real value in keeping traditional crafts and skills alive and there's this potential to marry that kind of stuff up with technologies that's going to unlock you know what happens next mm. and i don't know i i saw jane goodall talk in like the in seoul in the 90s and uh and that was terrifying. And she was talking about the environmental change that was happening. And again, you know, I was, that was part of me going like, actually crap, I need to, I need to refocus mm. and put every bit of energy I have into like this planet because I value it. And I, I grew up, you know, surrounded by butterflies and mm. bugs and, you know, seeds that flew through the air. And I want, you know, I want to maintain that. Silent Spring came out when I was young yeah. I remember that going like a ripple through the grown-ups and me being like oh, <laughs> that's my future you know and I think the kids these days have an even bigger mm. mental burden of like we've stuffed this planet for them we need to think about mm. the next generation but um you know I do think it's possible I'm still I mean I'm either hopeful or I'm really crying um but I'm usually <laughs> hopeful about it and and yeah I mean I do get glimpses of solutions up at the uni and with the the people that are doing work up there but you know mm. they're they're all just doing their best and you know this is a global action time yeah um yeah it's i don't know what the there's just i don't know what's going to happen next and i mean i guess i've probably felt that way for quite a number of years now but mm. it, it becomes more unknowable the, the, the longer it goes on um, but at least it's getting attention now. I mean, you know, mm. actually cops coming up. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot of positive and a lot to do. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Basic mindsets need to change. Wait, you know, it's going to be uncomfortable as well. You know, people don't. Well, they will as well. I mean, you know, the second that it comes to your doorstep. I mean, any, anyone that's already experienced it, like the people in Yorkshire the other year that had the, the floods, like, you know, they know. And, and anyone else, like anyone else that's had it, the people that are near the forest fires and people that are near the permaculture that's melting and the glaciers that have disappeared and, you know, people, like the fact that you can go, like, from Fiji to Iceland, I'm going to places and you're just seeing, like, litter everywhere. And it's not like, it's not like the people there are just throwing the litter. It's like, it's just, it, it blows around the world and floats around the world because it's just always there. Yeah. Um, okay, so are there, is there anything that you want to add? Is there anything that we've not covered that you want to talk about? No, I think, I think we've talked about, uh, a lot. Kind of all of it we've talked a lot yeah <laughs> just gone on and on um emma's right it is a little bit like therapy this <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 been very enjoyable to to share these perspectives because I, I mean these things rattle around in my brain all the time and mm. um my local friend group is probably a bit sick of hearing me whinge about them frankly <laughs> so i might as well share them more broadly um a, a problem shared is a problem halved day eh? yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I do wonder whether there's a political future where we all get to vote a bit more about mm. decisions. You know, actually, we could get rid of all the MPs and just vote directly mm. for things these days because we have the technology to do it. I mean, if we can vote for who stays on Big, in Big Brother, we can vote on, you know, whether or not we have a raise in school taxes or, you know, a road gets improved or what have you. It would require people to think a bit differently and actually you know if you see people trying to do collective efforts sometimes that doesn't always go very smoothly either but um mm. at the moment I can't say that we we might collectively I think we might do a better job than the politicians although we did collectively vote for Brexit so like I, I'm very torn about whether or not we could go <sighs> but the MB I mean system and well to, to be like, fair don't let that but, don't let that skew your um your your position because you know 
there's um for a start it was always going to be a leave vote because the only people who were really interested in voting on that were people who vote who wanted to leave mm. um the only thing that surprised me about it was the the actual turnout and that it was so close like I thought it would just be like leave out running it so I was like oh well you know I'm, I'm surprised that many people turned up and it was incredibly close and there was a lot of people that were excised out of it so you know but that's that's with any kind of election you always get these shenanigans so you know the results to result kind of thing but also they could have like with the scottish referendum they could have done you know it needs to be a clear majority of whatever otherwise it doesn't make a difference but i really liked after that like you know the, the having the elections so close like i liked the fact that there was three years where we were voting on something I was like, I could do this every year. We should be doing this every year. This yeah. should be a big thing for us to vote on every year. Yeah. Um, and, you know, well, we'd get better with practice. It's like, oh, well, you can't trust the public because the, do you know why we're not good at being democratic or being, uh, or being Democrats? We don't get the practice. You know, if you want to be good at anything, you need to practice it. And do, doing the little thing once every four years, that's not practice. You know, yeah. what are you learning from that? What do you, what do you, what are you achieving from that? If we were doing it every year, our yeah. positions would change a lot more. I think it'd be great. Or even every month, you know, I'm yeah. sure there's local issues that need local decisions. And, well, that's and why do we need a parliament? They're not experts. They don't know anything. They haven't got any skills or talents or qualification. They're, they're, they're nobodies, largely. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I'm a little more sympathetic to them. I think it's a hard <laughs> job, but... I, and I I, w I don't envy them their position, you know. I, I do mm. think they do they do have difficult work ahead of them. I appreciate the the challenge of having like multiple groups to balance the views yeah. of and that kind of thing. Um, but I do think that we could collectively practice decision making more, and and yeah. we have the technologies to do it. And we we could even set up ways that those technologies. You know where we would trust them because I think there is also that kind of like oh once you start clicking the box somebody yeah. at the end of it could make it say whatever you want but yeah. you know there are ways around that and yeah. yeah I have some hope that we might be able to I mean we're going to have to make better decisions going forward frankly or we're all going to die it's right. like you know we might not be this generation but it's very likely to be oh I, th 30 I think it's gonna years. Be, yeah I think it's going to be much closer like Home might be pandemic. underwater soon you know yeah. <laughs> like yeah um that's a big concern uh well, that, this is the other thing as well once london goes underwater which it will like okay so but what kind of what kind of migrant conversation are you going to have then are we going to build a big wall across watford and, and arm it with gun turrets for people leaving london yeah. there's plenty of people in the north who'd say yes to that <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed. But, you know, if it's like once <laughs> once it goes underwater, it's like, well, what are they going to rule when there's none of them there, and who's going to be in charge then? And yeah. like, you know, and where where is where is the services that the state what what's left of them? But the services that the state actually provide, where are they going to go? Where are they going to come from at that point? Like, will all of these satellite offices be able to manage themselves when everything's been so centralized? Yeah. It, we'll find out. These are questions that have plagued me for quite a while, actually, because, of course, water sec water industry, you, you know, mm. the awareness that this is going to happen is much higher than in the general population. Mm. And, you know, I don't think it's an if, it's a when. Yeah, and, yeah. and you start to and, and you start to question things like, well, you know, should we actually be spending a lot of money on trying to build flood defenses in some places where we, you know, actually, where they're gonna maybe get we should think differently about where we yeah. locate They've, properties yeah. and yeah. build new property i mean there's been yeah. a lot of building on floodplains mm. um since i've been here and you know yorkshire water get consulted about it or the environment agency mm. get consulted about it but you only like have a little bit of say in the overall thing and then mm. you find there's houses there and then they're flooded and you're like well yeah we did mention that you shouldn't build there <laughs> mm. but some somebody got in the way and approved it anyway but um yeah it's a uh, you know, it's it's the most exciting time to be alive, though. You're going to just <laughs> get to see such interesting history in the making going forward. Um, mm. And I think, you know, it, it, the pandemic has helped us in some ways move forward in, in what's in try some of those solutions. I mean, I've been living distantly from my whole family since the 90s. So you know a lot of the things that 
I saw people very upset about during the pandemic, I was like, oh, maybe, you know, I actually chose to do that. You know, I chose mm -hmm. to live far away. I only talked to my parent, my mom through Skype. I talked to her once a week, but mm -hmm. you know, um, she's grown up away from her grandchild. Like all, all these, that's where I had the problem in the pandemic actually is like, wait, everybody's complaining about this stuff. And that's my <laughs> life most of the time. And I thought it was okay. But now I've, I've kind of, admitted to myself that maybe some of some of it's been more stressful to me than other. I, I'm a, yeah. I don't tend to notice my stress in the moment I tend to look back and go oh I was really stressed that's why things didn't make much sense or I was struggling with decision makings mm. you know I needed a little bit of a little bit of me time but um yeah I think people need to be encouraged to take good care of themselves and to value things that are good for them and good for the environment and mm. And we need to collectively as a culture stop giving attention to the bling and the and start being just a bit like, it's a bit nasty for you to be so greedy. Could you be a bit more kind and maybe distribute some of that to some people who need it? Because there's no way that mm. we should have on one end of the spectrum people not being able to feed themselves and on the other end of the spectrum people having so much money they could never spend it in their entire life. Mm. <laughs> People going to, to work in jobs and then going to a food bank. Yeah. Not, not acceptable. No, no. <clears throat> we need that change. We are the wind of change in what we're doing right now. And, 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 and it's, it's increment. People also don't recognize, you know, like the positive thing is actually the incremental small changes you're making are kind of, we could snowball this. This mm. could be, you know, we could from the bottom up start be, being the change we need to see. Mm. and where we find points where culture doesn't let us do that kind of coalescing around those things and mm. like white blood cells around a virus and say mm. you know this needs to go this is mm. not healthy for the the culture mm. and we need more art and more music and more support for artists and musicians because they help bring the joy and the joy is what helps get us through the you know the challenge and helps mm. us in feel inspired enough mm. to bring those solutions, you know, to, to have the moment of levity that makes, puts your brain in the right state, that the, the, the genius solutions are out there in somebody's mind. Mm. You know? Like that, like I, I don't, I would never or want to be the team. Huh? Or part of it, part of the solution, you know, like you and yeah. someone else has got the other part and we need to get them. Yeah, we need to get the puzzle pieces all on the table and then fit them together. I'm I'm the person that helps get the puzzle pieces on the table. I don't ever want to lead any of it. I'm just like, I'm so, <laughs> so much enjoy the the supporting it. You know, I would be backstage mm. if I were on a theater production. I, I've been on stage, but I didn't like that. I would much prefer to like help the bigger picture happen. Mm. And that's not a really overly valued place to be in society i value it i enjoy it but like you know actually the collective goodness of people I mean, maybe we should spend more time in the news on like good stuff i know mm. the news tries to do that every once in a while and it usually sounds like a local donkey did something funny kind of story but um you know we do need a bit a bit more positivity maybe with each other and kindness as well as the you know the fire under us that it's all yeah. going to burn if we don't get it sorted so let's pull yeah. our socks up <laughs> <laughs> and let's make those socks the same socks that we've had for ages and darn the <laughs> darn the toes before we throw them away <laughs> if you give your dad some socks for christmas he will have socks for one out of every seven days but if you teach your dad to darn those socks they'll have them longer and some additional work to do and it may be a bit longer before they end up in the sea. I jest, kind of. So I hope you found all or at least some of that interesting and maybe stimulating. I would be really interested to hear from anyone who has heard all these episodes and hear how it's coming across. What themes are you seeing emerging? What's missing from the picture? What's lacking? Obviously Leeds is a diverse place and I only have 30 episodes but I do want to reflect the lawyer experience. So if you don't hear your role, your work, your voice, or contribution reflected back to you here, then get in touch and let's hear from you. Thank you again to Cara for being my guest. Thanks again to all my guests. And thanks to you, Bugalugs, for listening to this. Next time on Working Hours, I will be talking to someone else. Not sure who yet. 
Follow this show on Twitter at Working Hours 3 and on Instagram at Working Hours Pod Leads to know when episodes are being released. Or again, you could join the Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod to sign up and offer regular support. If I get two more patrons, then I promise I'll start putting more info up there about the show and I will be paying some attention to that in January. I've got two bonus episodes to go up there and another bonus treat to sort out that I haven't done yet. Okay, look, mate, I'm doing this at a cost to myself and that's a hard thing to motivate yourself around, okay? So if you're listening to this, then I assume that you have some connection to Leeds like living here or being from here if you're that person in Leeds or from Leeds and you haven't done a record for this yet send me a message now and let's record your working hours session email this podcast working hours pod at western-studios.com with a short bio and some suggestions of your availability or just send me your feedback questions comments and queries I'm really interested to hear from anyone in Leeds or from Leeds in whatever industry sector or role you are in What is your experience? How do you feel about work? What do you like and not like? What do you do, Leeds? Please consider supporting this podcast further. I need champions for working hours and that's exactly what you will be by giving £1 a month via Patreon to this podcast. That's right, it's only a quid a month for loiners to support and grow this project. Go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod to sign up and offer regular support. Please remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to this show. Working Hours is presented, edited and recorded by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org.